Good evening. This is Vice Chair Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend and those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's hybrid Board of Education meeting is being held both virtually and in person by board members and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live, NBCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting All items will be done sorry, by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the July 13th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I believe there is. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes. I move to postpone items F and G until the next meeting on August 10th and to move item S to follow item E. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Ms. Joes? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Scott's not here, who's the chair of PRC. I do want to make a comment to the board that some of these policies have been going back and forth between PRC and uh, the, the, the board for quite a few months. And um, specific, specifically, the last policy, 8601, use of social media, that was specifically asked by the Office of Inspector General of Education in, on January 28, 2021. It's almost six months. If we were to send that policy back to PRC or postpone it, it would be almost, um, by the time it's approved, it would be October, November. So just to keep that in mind, because we are being monitored to approve that policy by the OIG's office. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Board members, any other questions or comments? Ms. Causey, and then Ms. Thomas, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas was first. You just didn't see him. Mr. Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have been reviewing these policies, and I think it's really important that we actually have a discussion on these policies in today's meeting. I think we also have to take them into consideration um, for vote. Uh, so uh, I, I really think we should be discussing these policies since they've been 
time and time again sent back to committee and brought back to the full board. And I feel like if the full board needs to address these policies, then they should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Causey? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, as a member of Policy Review Committee, um, I had sent an email to uh, board members uh, with my perspective of the policies. Uh, the policy came forward to the full board at first reader. Uh, board members had several comments um, and concerns about it as well as our public when it was uh, on the agenda at the P PRC meeting, um, it was indicated that, that there were no changes, no revisions um, <clears throat> allowed to that policy. So it's coming back in exactly the same form. Um, I agree that it's important, um, but I do not believe it's in, um, it's, it's not modified at all based on what the board member comments were previously. Um, so I think that it would take an extensive amount of time to address all of those issues. And I think we have a very, packed agenda item. I would also, uh, in, in keeping with some other comments, I think it might be good to have uh, the policy reviewed by the Office of Inspector General to um, make sure that it's um, sufficient um, because I, in the condition that it is now, I don't think it's ready for a vote and I don't think we have time to do the work of the committee this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager was next and then I had a comment and then Ms. Joes, um, I'll turn to you. Um, actually, related to what Ms. Causey said, the, um, several of the policies were, were not modified, as, as she mentioned, um, when they went back to PRC. Would this, uh, would this motion make it so that the PRC, that any of these go back to PRC or just delay the, the discussion of them? So Thank they wouldn't continue to be evaluated, correct? Do, Thank you, just Dr. Delay? Hager. Correct. This motion postpones um, these two agenda items to the next meeting agenda. Right. So PRC would not see them again. Um, unless PRC were to schedule a special meeting, correct. Thank you. Um, my comment is that given the time and given the agenda as it currently stands, I don't feel like we have time to do these policies justice with the discussion. So I will be supporting the motion to postpone the discussion and public comment because I do feel we need to hear from our public before discussing the policies. Um, so I intend to support Mr. McMillian's motion accordingly. Ms. Joes? Yes. I would like to amend Mr. McMillian's motion to postpone item F, public comment and policies, and strike out item uh, G. So we would process item G, report on board policies by the PRC chair. So I Ms. move Jones, to could, strike. Would uh, you please put your um, yeah. amendment in the chat, and I'll restate it. Ms. Joes moves to strike item G for postponement. Mr. McMillian, do you accept Ms. Joes's? I think I need to, right? Amendment? No, the, According the amendment to. has to be processed. Is there a second for Ms. Joes's? Second, Thomas. Okay. Any dis um, questions or discussion? Ms. Causey? So while I, um, I am going to support Mr. McMillian's motion, I am not going to support the amendment. Um, I would uh, really not want to process it with uh, not having the public make their comments prior, which is how it was set up. So in my opinion, we need to uh, remove them both. Um, and um, for those that had planned to make public comment um, on the policies, if we um, postpone them to the next meeting, um, then we'll certainly appreciate to hear from our public at that time. Thank you, Ms. Causey. The board discussed at our last meeting the importance of um, scheduling public comment prior to discussing policies. And in fact, this was a change made in response to that discussion. I believe it was Mr. Kuhn who raised this important issue. So I, um, too, will not be supporting striking um, only item G, public comment on policies. I would rather have both on the same meeting agenda. And again, given the time and the need to discuss these at length, we'll be supporting Mr. McMillian's original motion as it stands. Um, board members, any other questions or comments before we vote? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Ms. Hanner, are we voting on the amendment? 
We are voting on Ms. Joe's amendment. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Mr. Q? No. Dr. Hager? No. Favor is three. Thank you. So that motion fails. Um, we are now processing Mr. McMillian's. Is there any other discussion on Mr. McMillian's motion? Dr. Hager? Does it require a motion to separate the two parts of Mr. McMillian's motion? So um, he motion to move one part of the agenda forward and to postpone another part, correct? It would be an amendment, I believe. Mr. Bursades, could you weigh in on Dr. Hager's question? <laughs> Would it require a motion yeah. to? Yes, that would require a motion to to amend it to separate it. Was that correct, Mr. McMillian? There were two parts to the motion. Oh, sorry. Is it in the chat? I can't see it. It's fine. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ms. Governor. May we have a roll call vote? On Mr. McMillian's motion? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Favor is seven. Thank you, and that motion carries. The agenda stands as amended. Okay. Are there any other changes to tonight's agenda? Mrs. Causey? Madam Chair, I make a motion to um, postpone item P, unfinished business, consideration of board policies. Is there a second? Second row. Any discussion? Ms. Tan, I'd like to speak Ms. to Ms. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the Policy Review Committee meeting and I uh, reviewed all of these. Um, several of these were not approved by the board to move forward to second reader uh, because there had been discussion in a prior meeting and a board member had called the orders of the day and so uh, that agenda item was ended and moved past, so the board did not even take a vote to move the majority of these to second reader. So again, I think that these um, deserve uh, consideration. Some of them, um, you know, there were questions and comments that were not addressed in the policies. Um, so I think that in the interest of time and in also in properly deliberating um, that these would come back in another meeting. I do apologize. Vice Chair, to can I speak to the second? I do apologize to members of the board. However, Ms. Causey, I'm afraid you're inaccurate as to the uh, the vote. All of those items that were um, on the last board meeting, where items were placed, uh, were not voted on by the board. All of those policies are being brought forward for first reader this evening. I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Howie, which policies exactly? I had sent in an email requesting uh, clarification on those issues um, because with the policy number of policies being returned to Policy 0100, the, policy 3800, policy 4011, policy 5210, policy 5600. Those were all on first reader, not voted on at the June meeting and are also on first reader this evening. Are we talking about yes, thank item you. P? Item P, all of those items were voted on previously. The items that Ms. Causey mentioned that were not voted on uh, on first reader, you just postponed until the next meeting. Was it clarified for um, the board 
if those had come out of um, policy review. I believe your question, ma'am, is that they whether came out or not review. the policies that were being presented for second reader had actually been voted on for first reader. All of those policies that are presented for second reader were approved by the board for first reader. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'll retract my last statement, but I will um, still support the motion that we're going to um, be processing a lot this evening, um, and there, um, I think it would be better to postpone it with the other policies. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Rowe would like to speak to her second. Ms. Rowe? So that was my question as well, as I had had questions about whether or not um, we had actually voted on first or second reader. So these items are second reader, Ms. Howie, that's correct? That is correct, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any other questions before we vote, board members? Ms. Joes? I, I want to point out that this is a business meeting of the board, and I want to, on the record, the January 28, 2021 letter that the Office of Inspector General recommended that Baltimore County Public Schools, the Board of Education, incorporate a use of social media policy governing BCPS staff and the board, and um, that, and updating the board handbook as well. We, I want to ask Ms. Howie, while we postpone these policies, are we going to be out of compliance? Because I know the handbook is five years old, and we cannot bring it up to vote till we update some of these policies. So postponing and playing football with these policies is hindering the work of the board, and I, and I want to state that on the record since this will be watched by the OIG. So Ms. Howie, if you could please clarify that. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Han, am I permitted to speak at this point? Yes, Ms. Howie, and, and I just wanted to confirm for the board members, and I'll turn it over to you, that we are um, discussing a motion regarding policies um, in agenda item P1 through um, P5, the policies um, that have already been postponed um, were items G1 through G11. Yes, ma'am. So uh, as to Ms. Uh, Ms. Joseph's question, the policies that are on second reader were voted on by PRC and voted favorably by PRC at the April meeting of PRC. None of the policies that are being presented for second reader were addressed by the Office of the Inspector General in the Inspector General's letter. That was the policy on social media. And that's already been postponed until your next meeting. Thank you, Ms. Howie, and thank you, Ms. Jones, for the, the comment. Um, thank you, Ms. Howie. I'm catching up with Ms. Mr. Thomas. You were next. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm just a little concerned that if we're not addressing the policies in the previous items that were already uh, postponed, and we're not addressing the policies in item P, then as a board, isn't it our duty to process the recommendations and the policy review committees everything that's going on in the policy review committee, I just feel like we should be addressing the policies that were brought to the full board uh, in any way. Like, policies are one of the most important jobs of the Board of Education, and it's one of the most important things that we would be doing as board members. And to just not address it in this meeting, which is the only meeting we have in the month of July, it, it just, it makes me feel like we're not doing our duty to address the policy and to review um, what these policies have originally stated. So. Uh, I don't agree that we should be postponing this agenda item. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you, Ms. Hanna. I, I just want to clarify that we were indeed just talking about item P and those five policies there. We've already, we've already processed the previous motion and moved everything else to the f following meeting. So. That's what we're focused on at this point, correct? Correct, Mr. Kuhn. Just clarifying, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, board members? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? 
Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Thank you. Favors two. Thank you. The motion fails and the revised agenda um, stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, as well as nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. <coughs> the minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Ms. Lowry. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D6? So moved, Matt. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Causey. Thank you. And I believe um, we may need to separate item D1 for the student member to vote on termination. Is that correct? Okay. Um, who cannot vote on D1? So. Let's separate these out. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matter in Exhibit D1? So moved, Rob. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Mac. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Ms. Gilbert? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mac? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 through D6? So moved, Matt. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, second Thomas. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Vice Chair Hen and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. The principal of Catonsville Middle School, the principal of Glenmar Elementary School, the principal of Randallstown Elementary School, the principal of Randallstown High School, the principal of Relay Elementary School, the principal of Sandy Plains Elementary School, the principal of Western School of Technology, the principal of Windsor Mill Middle School, the assistant principal of Franklin High School, the assistant principal of Hartford Hills Elementary School, the assistant principal of Hawthorne Elementary School, the assistant principal of Owings Mills High School, Assistant Principal at Stimmers Run Middle School, Assistant Principal at Stonely Elementary School, the Assistant Principal at Vincent Farm Elementary School, Chief Human Resources Officer in the Division of Human Resources, Executive Director of Schools Secondary West Zone Division of School Support and Achievement, Director of CTE and Fine Arts in the Office of CTE and Fine Arts, the Supervisor of Visual Learning Program, Elementary School Office of 
I'm sorry, the supervisor of virtual learning program in the elementary school in the office of virtual learning program, the supervisor of the virtual learning program in middle schools in the office of virtual learning programs, the supervisor of the virtual learning programs of high school in the office of virtual learning programs, a specialist, school counseling, office of school counseling, coordinator, library media program, office of digital safety, educational technology, and library media, the coordinator of, of the virtual learning programs of middle schools in the office of virtual learning programs, the coordinator of the virtual learning programs of high school in the office of virtual learning programs, and pupil personnel worker point six in the office of pupil personnel services. <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved. So moved, so moved Dr. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Aye. Yes. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay, so our first appointment is uh, Shira Anderson as the Chief Human Resources Officer in the Division of Human Resources. There she is, okay. Uh, she is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so welcome. She brings a wealth of experience as the Chief Human Resources Officer in the Office of the Attorney General in the District of Columbia. Next candidate is Stacy S. Berry as the Supervisor of the Virtual Learning Program Elementary Schools in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. She brings to us 14 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, Currently, she served as the teacher resource in the Blended Learning Support Office of Digital Safety, Educational Technology, and Library Media. We'll hold the pause to the very end because there's so many. <laughs> the next candidate is Amber S. Cook as assistant principal at Stonely Elementary School. She brings to us seven years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the teacher resource in the Office of Mathematics. Next candidate is Christina J. Davis as principal of Sandy Plains Elementary School. She brings to us 11 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Red House Run Elementary School. Next, we have Jessica L. D. Shields, specialist school counseling, the Office of School Counseling. She brings to us 18.3 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the school counselor at Lock Raven Technical Academy. Next, we have Matthew T. Doty, coordinator of the virtual learning programs for high school in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. He brings 13.6 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he is the STEM team leader at Chesapeake High School. Next, we have Stephanie Fanshaw as the principal of Catonsville Middle School. She brings to us 29 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Golden Ring Middle School. Next, we have Sherry C. Fisher as the director of CTE and Fine Arts in the Office of Career and Technical Education and Fine Arts. She brings to us 15 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the coordinator of virtual, uh, sorry, visual arts, the Office of Career and Technical Education and Fine Arts. Next candidate is Heather Gaskin. Pupil Personnel Worker, point six, in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services. Welcome, Ms. Gaskins, to Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, previously, she served as the coordinator in the Shepherd Pratt Type 2 program in the Shepherd Pratt Health System, uh, as well as uh, Severn River Middle School. The next candidate is Lisa M. Grace principal of Relay Elementary School. She brings 13 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Dogwood Elementary School. 
Next candidate is Dr. Roderick S. Hobbs, principal of Windsor Mill Middle School. Welcome, Dr. Hobbs, to Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, he's the principal at Andrew Jackson Academy in Prince George's County Public Schools. Next candidate is Michael S. Jones, principal of Randallstown High School. He brings to us 12 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he's the principal of Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. Next candidate is Kiria L. Joseph as the executive director of schools and secondary West Zone Division of School Support and Achievement. She brings to us 17.7 years in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she serves as the principal of Milford Mill Academy. Next candidate, please. Amanda D. Lanza as the coordinator of library media programs in the Office of Digital Safety, Educational Technology, and Library Media. She brings to us 17 years of experience. Her current position is the specialist library media in that same Office of Digital Safety, Educational Technology, and Library Media. Next candidate is Erica R. Lundy. Assistant Principal at Hawthorne Elementary School. She brings to us nine years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's a teacher resource at Edmondson Heights Elementary School. Next candidate is Ross J. Martin, Supervisor, the Virtual Learning Programs Middle Schools in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. He brings to us 12 years of service in Baltimore County. He's a current science teacher at Middle River Middle School. Next candidate is Terry D. Moses as the assistant principal at Franklin High School. She brings to us 24 years of service in Baltimore County. She's the current assistant principal at Southwest Academy. Next we have Caroline O'Neary as the principal of Glenmar Elementary School. She brings to us 16 years of service in Baltimore County. She's currently the assistant principal at Perry Hall Elementary School. Next, we have Jesse Parks Bradley, assistant principal at uh, Vincent Farm Elementary School. She brings seven years of service in Baltimore County. She's the current staff development teacher at Hollibert Middle School. Next, we have Madeline Phillips as the assistant principal at Stemmers Run Middle School. She brings to us 12 years of service in Baltimore County. She's the current resource teacher at Overly High School. Next, we have Lauren Provota, assistant principal at Owings Mills High School. She brings to us 13 years of service in Baltimore County. She's the current science teacher at Chesapeake High School. Next, we have Jewel M. Ralph, Principal, Western School of Technology. She brings to us 22 years of service. Caroline O'Neary. Okay. As the principal of Glenmar Elementary School, she brings to us 16 years of service in Baltimore County. We had to say that one one more time. Henry Hall Elementary School. Next, we have. Sorry, Miss Ralph, I was just on the roll. Jewel M. Ralph, principal of Western School of Technology. She brings to us 22 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the principal at Cadenceville Center for Alternative Studies. Next, we have. We can advance to the next slide. No, I'm not, I'm not. Oh, there we go. Next, we have Kelsey N. Singleton, assistant principal at Hartford Hills Elementary School. She brings to us eight years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she is the mathematics teacher at Cockeysville Middle School. Next, we have 
Amy M. Stevens, Supervisor, Virtual Learning Programs High School in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. She brings to us nine years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the teacher of e-learning science in the Office of Educational Opportunities. Next candidate is Misha C. Sutton, Coordinator of Virtual Learning Programs for Middle Schools in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. She brings 22 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the Assistant Principal at Sparrows Point Middle School. And we have Michelle Valerio, Principal, Randallstown Elementary School. She brings to us eight years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's serving as the Assistant Principal at Randallstown Elementary School. Now we can congratulate all 26 appointments at this time. <laughs> and once again, I would like to thank Ms. Lowry and her team and all of Central Office and our school-based team for us to be able to fill all of these positions for today's board meeting. Thank you. Hello, good evening, this is Chair Scott. Um, we'd like to ask all callers to mute their phones. Apparently we're getting um, um, some feedback. Great, and thank you so much, Ms. Hen. I'm sure the board members all appreciate Ms. Hen stepping in, doing a great job, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. So um, I understand there were some changes, and so it looks like our, um, I'll read from the script, actually. Oops, there you go. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrants are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. So. Looks like our first speaker is um, our stakeholder group. Okay, sorry, there's still more. <laughs> While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. For more information, for more information um, is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. So, and, and again, um, if you are not speaking, if we could ask all um, callers to mute their phones. So um, 
I have our list here. It doesn't look like we have any elected officials because it's usually the practice to allow elected officials to go first. Um, but we will start with our stakeholder group leaders. And our first speaker um, from our stakeholder group is William Burke. Mr. Burke, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Scott, Mrs. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak as the newly appointed executive director for the Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees. I am honored to have been chosen to represent and support the members of CASE. I look forward to a positive and productive working relationship with the board and BCPS staff. I recognize and am thrilled that my next chapter continues the work of improving the school system I dearly love. CASE members have spent the last 18 months as the first messengers of the changes made due to the pandemic. They have mastered the art of turning on a dime when the governor or the state superintendent or the BCPS board or the superintendent directed a change in reaction to the pandemic, case members explained that change, held the required trainings, answered questions from staff, students, and parents, calmed fears, were shoulders to cry on, monitored implementation, and made appropriate changes when necessary. And many times they did it all again every three or four days. Staff is exhausted. They need to hear from you that you understand how hard this was and how hard they are working. They need you to understand the trauma their communities have experienced and the secondary trauma they themselves have worked through. They need you to defend them when they are trolled on the internet they need you to champion that problems can be resolved without disrespect. They need you to model that honesty without kindness is brutality. As we move towards full reopening, case members have expertise and ideas and need to be at the table as plans are being developed. They need to be able to present alternative options without being seen as oppositional. Case members want to do a good job. They want to be held accountable, but we've never been through this before. There are no playbooks or processes that are proven for such a unique situation. So we ask for grace. So what is grace? Believe people are working with the best of intentions. Provide training and support. Allow and encourage risk-taking. Acknowledge and respond to trauma. Be honest about performance, but look first to support growth and improvement. We have an opportunity to move forward and be better. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker in general public comment is Jim Hamill. Mr. Hamill, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Dear members of the Board of Education, I'm a Baltimore County public school teacher with over 30 years of experience. Almost all of them have been with BCPS. I come to speak with you tonight about the eighth grade American history curriculum writing workshop planned this summer. The pilot curriculum will be implemented this fall in the following middle schools, Dumbarton Middle, Hereford Middle, Parkford, Parkville Middle, and Pine Grove Middle. The focus of the curriculum will be American history through the lens of racial social justice. Required reading for the course includes even these Candy is a proponent of critical race theory, and Baltimore County's new eighth grade American history pilot will affirm and promote this ideology. Critical race theory offers no racial reconciliation. Kendi writes, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination, and the only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. 
I implore each of you to call for an immediate pause to the implementation of this pilot curriculum for a period of no less than 20 months. In this time, teachers, parents, and other members of the board may read, review, and provide written and verbal feedback to the board and the Office of Social Studies. This pause should be extended for as many months as the Board of Education is meeting in hybrid form. Further, I call upon each member of the board to publish for public review your opinion as to the intended benefit or potential harm of promoting critical race theory in our schools. In the same manner, the Board of Education must implement a system-wide halt to any required curriculum, program, or employee training that assigns privilege or victimhood or labels individuals as oppressor or oppressed based on that person's race, gender, religion, or identity. In my opinion, failure to call for such a halt will place the Board of Education in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, as well as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In researching your opinion of critical race theory, I ask you to look beyond Baltimore County's public schools site entitled Readings and Resources About Race. These resources all support the point of view that our founding documents and our current society are racist. There aren't any resources listed that provide a different point of view, even though there are numerous black scholars who do not view the United States as inherently racist. A short list of these black scholars include Dr. Carol Swain, Thomas Sowell, Jason Riley, Walter Williams, Glenn Lowry, Shelby Steele, John McWhorter, Robert Woodson, Clarence Thomas, Condoleezza Rice, Coleman Hughes, and Larry Elder. There are so, so many more. BCPS has turned its back on critical thinking in regards to discussions about race. Our job is to teach students how to think, not what to think. I agree with Shelby Steele when he asked, when do we become more than the color of our skin and when do our children become more, respectfully. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mackenzie Allen. Authors no racial reconciliation. Andy Wright. I'm sorry. The only remedy. Oh, okay. Could you mute, please? Mute your device. So next is Mackenzie Allen. Mackenzie Allen, are you there? If you're on the line, um, Mackenzie Allen, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, I think, is that Mackenzie Allen? Yes. <laughs> okay, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, thank you, board members, public, and BCPS staff for allowing me the opportunity to provide public comment today. My name is Mackenzie Allen, and I'm the executive director of the Maryland Alliance of Public Charter Schools. We are a nonprofit organization comprised of all of the charter school operators across the state of Maryland. We represent over 21,000 students in over 47 schools in seven districts. This includes Watershed Public Charter School, which is located in your district. Our public charter schools, like all public schools, were deeply impacted by the pandemic, and we saw public education pivot in response to the circumstances. The federal government also pivoted, voting to supply LEAs and SEAs across the country with much-needed relief funds. The federal guidance for these funds and the guidance upheld by MSDE stated that LEAs could use these restricted funds in two ways. They could spend it systemically across the entire district for all students and schools to receive equitable receipt of items, resources, and the like. The other way was that the money could be dispersed in an equitable per pupil fashion. These ESSER, the ESSER funds provided to Baltimore County Public Schools were significant, more than $96 million in ESSER II alone. We saw almost all of our districts with charter schools provide a per pupil allotment of those funds directly and equitably to the charter schools to spend at their sites. Unfortunately, in ESSER, the funding in ESSER 1 and 2 were not shared equitably through systemic spending across BCPS or provided as a per pupil to Watershed Public Charter School. To my understanding, Watershed received little in systemic spending from round one and absolutely nothing in round two. There were no conversations on what these funds were spent on or per pupil allotment considered in both rounds. 
While this is unfortunate and inequitable, that money has been spent and is no longer accessible due to its restricted nature. As we are fast approaching the disbursement of ESSER 3, assumed to be almost double that of ESSER 2, I ask for a consideration of an equitable per pupil disbursement to Watershed Public Charter School. It is the job of every school and the district to be safe and meet every student with what they need during this unique time. Watershed has had to find and reallocate funds to meet those demands, while the district has been retaining the ESSER funds without consideration of the Watershed School community. As a reminder, Watershed students are Baltimore County Public School students, and Watershed's educators and administration are employees of BCPS. They deserve their share of that funding to spend it as reflectively of their school community as possible. They have more than shown their hard work and dedication to the district and continue to do so regardless of obstacles in their way. They also only strengthen the argument to provide an amendment to extend their charter contract for one additional year to a five-year contract. They have truly been doing so much more with less and held to incredibly high accountability standards these last two years. Thank I welcome you. the conversation first. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Demarius Hodges. Demarius Hodges, are you there? Okay, we'll go to our next speaker, Darren Badillo. Darren Badillo, are you there? Okay, we'll go to our next speaker. This is Jen Reed Home. No, it's uh, Darren Badillo. Uh, Dar Darren. Okay, we'll go to our next speaker, Barbara Willett. Barbara Willett. Um, Ms. Willett, if you're there, we can't hear you. Okay, we'll go to our next speaker, Mary Taylor. Mary Taylor. If you're there, we can't hear you. Okay, our next speaker is Jen Reed Holm. Can you hear me? Who's, is this Ms. Reed Holm? Yes. Okay, yes, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I'll be focusing on board communication and professionalism, and I just want to thank everyone for doing what's right and placing the public meeting comments back to the beginning of the meeting. <clears throat> I would like to point out that the actions that this board has taken to silence parents, teachers, students, and other stakeholder groups will not be tolerated. I understand that not all board members are subscribing to the actions of a few. However, it is a reflection of the entire board and the public, public comment agenda item is pushed to the end of the meeting after years of it being at the beginning. You also remove the ability to send in written comments to be officially included in the minutes. Those who are not picked for oral comment or are not comfortable speaking in a large group setting should still have an opportunity to be heard by the public. Removing the ability to send in your written comments was never addressed in any meeting nor voted on, and by not allowing them to be published is a clear message that this board does not care about what the stakeholders think. Stakeholders are putting children first. The reason the school system exists is for the children. This board has yet to put the children first. And while I know that doesn't mean every one of you, because I've heard some of you try to make things right, the fact is that, that the majority of the board does not, and that's why nothing ever gets accomplished. Keeping the meetings only virtual is another clear message that you don't want to hear or even see the public. The state of emergency is over. Open the doors. We're waiting there right now. These latest actions are not just shutting down one or two groups that you don't happen to agree with, but it's shutting down everyone, including groups you may agree with. And no matter if you agree with any particular group or not, you should be unbiased in your governance over the school system. And it's very clear that some board members have their own personal agendas. But make no mistake, we, the public, know who is at the heart of changes like these. And we will remember that come election time, whether it be on this board or any other political venture in your future, we will not forget these moments you didn't have to create. If you ever listen to a state board of education meeting, 
The board members are so welcoming to public speakers. They're professional and respectful. They show so much appreciation for what the public has to say and seem to really care by truly taking into account what the public contributes. Speakers feel like they matter and they're being heard. Professionalism, courtesy, and appreciation is what the state board consistently demonstrates. I feel this board is annoyed that the public even gets to comment at all. That is shown loud and clear when you don't respond to email correspondence as well as when public speaks to the school board. You barely acknowledge them. Papers are rustling. Members are typing on their laptops. And no one can see the public speakers, nor have you ever tried to make that happen. Board members' cameras are not on, and the public can't even see the board members all at one time. Yet the technology exists. The state board can do it. Why can't you? By continuing to silence the stakeholders, your master plan is backfiring right in front of you. Remember these words from Martin Luther King Jr. People fail to get along. Thank you. They That's time. Each other. They fear Thank each you. Other because they so our each next other. speaker is Kelly Krubinski. Kelly Krubinski, um, if you're there, you may go ahead. And I remind speakers, once your time has expired, to um, um, please stop speaking. Our next speaker is Kelly was, Krupinski. Are you there, Ms. Krupinski? My name's Darren Badillo. I was skipped over. If I can speak, I'm on the line. Okay, yes. We didn't hear you. So, yes, we can, um, we'll come back to Ms. Krupinski um, if Mr. Badillo is ready. If you're there, sir, yes, you may um, go ahead. Okay, are you ready for me now? Yes, we are. Perfect, perfect. Uh, my name is Darren Badillo. I'm the director of Baltimore Youth Coalition and founder of God's Grace. But most importantly, I'm a father of two students who go to BCPS. Um, and I just want to thank the board for moving up the public comment. Uh, we really appreciate that. Actually, me and a couple other parents are sitting out front right now. Uh, we were hoping that you would allow us to join you guys, um, but maybe next time. Uh, and I hope that, you know, it's important for you all to hear feedback from concerned parents. Um, it appeared that you didn't care uh, when you pushed it back last week and we're about to do it this week. And I hope that, you know, you, you take the information that you get and really understand that it's coming from parents that care about their kids and see what's going on. And we're trying to give you feedback. Uh, I would hope and pray that you all are humble enough to know that there were some bad decisions that were made last year, but virtual learning, it was a failure and we need solutions to help those children who feel even more behind this coming year. Please don't forget about the children with IEPs. Uh, they need more resources now than ever. Um, also, I wanted to just bring to your attention, hope you guys are thinking about trauma training, uh, whether it be for the teachers, uh, how, how to assist kids with trauma, and, and the students, that we should be talking to them about trauma and what trauma is. They say 70% of those who have faced trauma in their life end up abusing drugs. Let's help our children who have been through a traumatic experience with COVID. Something else I wanted to say, school violence was up 56% in 2018 and 2019. We need to support our teachers and students and to make sure we are giving them everything we can possible and setting them up for a successful education. We need, we need our children to be motivated, inspired, challenged, and to know that someone cares. And before we implement CRT or make changes to our education system, we need to do research. You know, we can't make decisions off the hip and then look back five years later and say that was a bad decision. You know, our, ch our children's future depends on it. Please do some more research. And last thing I want to say is that Baltimore County spends over 50 percent of their budget on education with no positive results. The, the trending is going backwards. I would hope that Baltimore County is open up to listening to our new ideas and new ways of providing a more successful and better education for our kids and our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our yeah, next speaker is, is Kelly right? Krupinski. Miss hmm. Krupinski. Barbara Wood, if he's not. I'm sorry, excuse me? This is Barbara Willett. I can speak if he is not available. Oh, okay. We came to you before, so you're ready now? Okay, we can come back to you. Go ahead. I, I might say to those who couldn't come get through either, if they press star six, that will unmute them. Um, I'm here uh, tonight, um, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams, and fellow board members, because I've uh, sent you a letter about the petition that um, was begun in May about high school schedules, and I hope that you've read um, my letter. 
and I'd like to reiterate some of the things in it. But first, I must say I am sorry that I couldn't speak on policy. I wanted to commend uh, the board on the additions to the equity policy. Uh, the hate symbol ban is um, needed. And I um, wanted you to know that my comments would be very complimentary if I had been able to, to give them. Um, my petition has 800, over 850 signatures, and it addresses um, the schedule uh, for high schools in the fall. Um, there was a uh, talking point memo communicated to the, by the central office to high school principals about changing their schedules for the fall. It doesn't have a date, so I question the timing and flexibility of this um, decision. And I had asked a former colleague if they were aware that DCPS had given teachers the opportunity during a very difficult year, I know, to initiate a schedule study. Um, the answer was no. Um, I also have learned through my social media um, networking that one of the four high schools that previously used the semester block schedule that I um, advocate in my pet petition is um, actually piloting eight semester classes this year without fully going through a schedule study. Um, I quoted a lot of um, people. I won't read uh, the people I quoted, but um, I also contacted a board member who uh, is under the um, idea that uh, the talking points are giving latitude and autonomy for decisions in the fall. Um, my local principal, um, I'm a retired teacher, by the way, um, and I, I know the school, um, but that principal is the official channels, uh, removing any chance of high schoolers in the Hereford zone having semester classes this fall, and a battle was fought back in 2014 when that schedule was removed as an option for the CPS. It's back. Um, my school community is very loud, but we are not alone. Obviously, this other school um, is, is discovering ways to help a few of their freshmen by allowing some semester classes for those core classes that aren't, um, you know, that don't build on another class. So, um, thank you, ma'am. Yes, you're thank welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, and it looks like our next speaker is. Kelly Krupinski. Hi, um, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for allowing me time to speak. Um, I'm assuming, is the full board present? I mean, I can't really see what's going on inside. I wish we could be in there with you all. Is everybody present? Are you finished with your comments? No, no, I'm just wondering, is this, is this a full school board present? Is every, all of, are all the board members in attendance tonight? Well, this isn't a uh, back and forth, so if you okay. would like right. to continue okay. with your I'll comments. My statement. That's fine. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Kelly at Kripinski. I'm a community home care-based um, occupational therapist, and I'm a mother of four sons, um, all of them whom have matriculated through BCPS in some form or fashion, um, sadly, I, I have to say that all four of my children have had less than favorable experiences. And after 15 years of, of work, working with BCPS, it has led me to one simple conclusion, that it is a failing institution. Um, while it seems harsh to say this, it boils down to one simple quote for me. Um, Trust is hard to earn and, and very easy to lose. And my experiences with my children have damaged my trust with BCPS, and there seems to be little attempt uh, to restore it. Uh, it seems lately like the majority of the energies on the board involve equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and I'm, I would ask a simple question, and I would ask, do you know what creates those things? Learning to read and write, learning math, science, and engineering. In, in spite of all of our efforts as parents, my husband and my own, to engage in this process with BCPS to make sure our children are literate in all, all the most important ways, it was clearly demonstrated to me 
as I am now, I would say with air quotes around it, the old mom, because I've been at this parenting thing now for 20 years, um, that, that this system is far too bogged down in top-heavy bureaucracy and ideology to do the job for which it was intended. In short, I would urge the board to remember this advice going forward after a difficult couple of years. Please stay in your lane. Do your job and stay out of politics and ideology. We need our children calm and focused and not eternally bickering about who is oppressing whom and how much. Um, I lovingly and gratefully concede the rest of my time. I, I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to speak and welcome the comments of people who come after me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wanted to go back to Mary Taylor. Ms. Taylor, yes, are you? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, can yes, please me? go ahead. We can we can hear you now. Well, thank you, Chair Scott, for coming back to me. I appreciate that. Apparently, we're having some technical issues this evening. Anyway, good evening, board. My name is Mary Taylor, and I'm the vice president of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm going to be brief. I just wanted to say we were here this evening because we were really concerned that the co uh, that myself and parents, excuse me, of the coalition, the public comment had been pushed to 10:40 p.m. It seems no regard to how this would impact parents, especially those with young children. So with that said, I'd like to thank you to those board members who voted to move public comment closer to the beginning. We very much appreciate that. I also like to say that we are out in the parking lot, as Mr. Badillo said, who's one of our members, hoping that we would be allowed into the room so we could watch this board in person. So we were not allowed in, we knocked on the door, and we were told that we could not have entrance at this time. So we would like to be at the next Board of Education meeting in August. So we're hoping that the Board of Education makes that happen. And why we really want to be in the board, and we're also requesting that the reopening be put back on the agenda because as a coalition and a group of parents, we want to make sure that we have a strong plan for, for return to fall, discussing the major loss of learning this past year and what's being done about it. Full disclosure of our children's curriculum, and that's just to name a few. We think that a few members of the board just don't want to face parents at this time. We can't think of any other reason why we keep being shut out and standing behind locked doors and being sat in the parking lot to watch this meeting. But we're here because we're dedicated and we do want to face the board eye to eye when we speak to you. So just want to say, you can't keep this out forever. And I would like to leave you all with this Martin Luther King Jr. quote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. And next, it looks like we have Miss Diana Bergman. Are you there, Miss Bergman? Good evening. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we can, Miss Bergman. Good evening, board. Hi, thank you. Good evening, um, Madam Chair Makita Scott and Superintendent Dr. Williams. Um, I want to share something with everybody. The Maryland Open Meetings Act Manual, 10th edition of January 2021, Chapter 2, Notice and Agendas. For meetings subject to the Act, in this case, the public body is Baltimore County Board of Education. Um, the public body has to give reasonable advance notice and make an agenda available. I received notice that the meeting was supposed to start at 6.30, along with notice to testify on second reader policy uh, at 7 p.m. And after 7 p.m., that's when we got unreasonable notice that the agenda was changed. And the voice of those that took the time to actually speak on second reader policy that actually provide the opportunity for the public to get involved, to make recommendations, to improve academic achievement for our students in BCPS it was denied. It was postponed. It wasn't to be heard because a few parents that can't follow the rules want to wait outside and interrupt and disrupt and willingly interrupt education. You know, what's funny is that we actually have a law in Maryland 
that um, we could cite somebody in Maryland criminally as a misdemeanor for interrupting instruction and education. So I'm hurt that we didn't have that opportunity to speak and participate. I took this time to read through all 11 policies for second reader that I've been following because I care. I care. That's the bottom line. I care about our children in BCPS. I care about our educator. And not everybody always has to agree, but the priority is our students and our educators and the public to be able to participate. This bickering, playing political football with the policies is dysfunctional to our school system as a whole. And we're better than that. It needs to stop. We can't bicker about little things over an agenda. Let's just get things done. Our kids are counting on us. They're watching us. Our educators are counting on us. So I'm confident. I'm confident with Dr. Williams because I know personally of what he could accomplish with Baltimore County Public Schools and all the new faces that are coming in. So all that noise is going to go away eventually. Eventually it's going to go away. And I hope the focus becomes back to our students and our educator and Team BCPS. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And our next speaker is Ms. Amy Adams. Ms. Adams, are you there? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, everyone on the Board of Education, Dr. Williams, and a special welcome to Mr. Thomas, the new student member of the board. I appreciate you all allowing us the opportunity to speak and especially moving up the public comment earlier in the evening. Um, I am a bit sad that we were not permitted to come in person to give our public comment, but I'm hopeful that that will be restored in the near future, as other counties in our state are also allowing. Now that we're returning to normalcy this year, I've taken some time to reflect. I'm thankful that I've had a window into my kids' education. I'm thankful that I've had that the prolonged closure of school prompted me and many other parents to pay attention to our school system. I'm proud of our reopen group that is formed into a parent and student coalition. I'm thankful for the Board of Education men members that willingly communicate with their constituents. I'm thankful that our schools will be open for five days a week this fall, and I look forward to hearing more about the details in the upcoming school year. The school system's main objective should be the education of our children, right? What can the board and the superintendent and his staff do to focus on this objective? As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated, the time is always right to do what's right. As I and other parents and some board members have requested before, I would like to hear discussion on academic data. It is not on this agenda at all tonight. Board members tried to have it be a standing item, and they were reassured it wasn't necessary because it would be included in the reopening discussion. But there are only five minutes given this evening to discuss the reopening, and that hardly seems like enough time. I know that standardized tests should not be the only indicator for academic progress, but I do think we can use it as a guide to evaluate trends and overall performance. There is a troubling trend for grades 3 through 11 on the Maryland Report Card MCAT scores from 2015 to 2019, pre-pandemic. Then add the fact that kids lost three months of instruction in the spring of 2020, failure rates increased, through the mostly virtual year, and our attendance rates were as low as 67% for some high school students. During these years, ELA scores trended down, and all grades are under 50% proficiency. In 2019, 9th and 11th grade students had a less than 5% proficiency in ELA, but our graduation rate in 2019 was 86%. How does you explain this? During the same years, math scores on the MCAT for 3rd through 8th grade, Algebra 1 and 2, and Geometry are a little more variable, but still all under 50% proficiency except for geometry in 2019, which was at 51%. Eighth grade students dropped to less than 5% proficiency in math in 2019. Two years during this period, less than 5% of proficiency rates for Algebra 2. But again, our graduation rates remain in the high 80%. I would like to understand how their curriculum department is looking at the data and formulating a plan to more successfully educate our children. The majority of our kids should not be graduating from high school with low proficiency rates in math and ELA. This, set, this is setting them up for failure after high school no matter what path they choose. How can we improve our educational programs for the benefit of all BCPS kids? How can BCPS effectively teach the science of reading, grammar, vocabulary, multiplication tables, and other basic Thank skills? Thank you very much how for that. How can the support? <laughs> Thank you. So thank you for everyone who spoke. That ends our public uh, comment section. Next on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. 
Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board of Education. Uh, let's begin tonight by welcoming our newest board member, Christian Thomas. Back in March, all middle and high school students across the county had the opportunity to vote for the student member of the board in our second ever system-wide election. Christian was sworn in on July 1st, surrounded by a host of family and friends. He has already had an outstanding leadership career that includes student government, academic excellence, and many community service opportunities. He even founded a nonprofit that mentors and supports students in need. Please help me welcome Christian. I am pleased to provide an overview of the opening of our school year as a part of my report, something slightly different. Next slide, please. Education Resources Strategies notes that as a result, as a result of the pandemic, children across the country need even more opportunities for differentiated, high-quality learning, even stronger relationships with the adults in their school, and even more streamlined access to social-emotional support. They go on to add, while new federal funding provides a much-needed infusion of resources, it will take years to address the academic and social-emotional needs that have emerged or have been exasperated as a result of the pandemic and the cost of doing so will far exceed the revenue most districts expect to receive. School systems are advised against adding temporary programs on top of existing structures. The approach must be on thoughtfully navigating ways to sustainably change existing structures in support of our students. The work of adapting and, I'm sorry, the work of adapting teaching and learning for the post-COVID era is best approached like stepping stones with a do now, build toward mindset. Next slide, please. As much as we would like to fast forward to our next normal, it's important to note that this process does not occur in a straight line. While planning for the school year begins in the spring and continues through the summer, we must recognize that the human element is cyclical and includes healing, recovery, and rebuilding. Coupled with a sustained focus on limited goals and clear communication in alignment with our strategic plan, this next year will require a collective commitment to create time and spaces focused on these three areas in order to move our system forward. Next year includes three specific areas of focus. Healing, acknowledging the year, take the lessons learned and support the social emotional needs of staff, students, and one another. Recovering, reestablishing bonds, relational trust, effective practices and processes that will help us build our collective capacity to serve and support students across BCPS. And rebuilding, taking the opportunity to refine and implement a standard of excellence where we focus on a limited number of priorities that yield maximum results. Next slide, please. So in planning for our fall, I want to make sure everyone has information needed to know what to expect. Our goal is for all BCPS students to have the option to experience five days face-to-face -face instruction. Our summer programs, a variety of exciting professional learning opportunities are available this summer to support our staff as well as an array of summer learning options for students. 21,697 students began participating yesterday and will continue until Friday, August 6th. Families had the option to choose in-person or virtual learning. 15,604 students have selected in-person opportunities. This number is an increase of 3,463 compared to the summer of 2020, in which 18,234 students participated in BCPS targeted and school-based summer learning programs. Next slide. Virtual learning. 
As you know, the state requested all local school systems to create a virtual learning option for families. BCPS has always had an e-learning option for students. This differs because it provides a K-12 option for families in direct response to the pandemic. Our virtual option for families will not, will not include concurrent teaching. Dedicated staff will plan and deliver lessons to students enroll in our program. It's important to note that students remain co-enrolled in their home school and virtual learning program for the year. They also will have the access to home school resources, including sports, meals, and extracurricular activities. It goes without saying that we want all of our students to learn at high levels. If a student is not being successful at the virtual learning program with enhanced supports, a collaborative decision will be made with the staff of the virtual learning program, homeschool staff, and parents regarding student placement. Next slide. In alignment with current best practice recommendations from educational experts, including the Learning Policy Institute, Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy, the New Teacher Project, and many others to school districts about post-pandemic learning approaches, we're developing a robust cross-divisional plan to implement accelerated learning to counteract the impact of unfinished learning. Accelerated learning is a newer evidence-based strategy that requires students to consistently receive grade level materials, tasks, and assignments, along with appropriate scaffolds that make the work accessible. More specifically, leaders and teachers will focus on filling in the most critical gaps, not in isolation, at the moment they're needed. We will continue our curriculum implementation of open court, bridges in ELA, and math in elementary schools. A comprehensive professional learning plan will work to build and support organizational understanding and action with teachers, paraprofessionals, teacher leaders, school administration, and central office in support of improved student outcomes. Next slide, please. As you know, we are rebuilding our data systems and are excited about expanding access to help inform the daily work of teaching and learning through Cognos and BCPS Inform. A cross-divisional work group is working on creating the professional learning plan to increase data literacy across Team BCPS to facilitate and support continuous improvement and the implementation of high-functioning teams across the organization. Our goal is to increase our collective capacity to use student data to drive instruction. My team will be able to provide an update in August during our school opening presentation. Next slide. So we recognize that we are still in a pandemic and there is some concern about variants. We will continue to prioritize health and safety with the understanding that our plans are subject to change based on state and county mandates. We continue to meet weekly with our health department and John Hopkins University partners to review the data and discuss CDC and state guidance to ensure alignment. Should there be a sustained change in transmission rates over a two week period, we are prepared to work with our partners to adjust practices in accordance with their guidance. As we open our doors to visitors and prepare for the fall, we will continue to focus on health and safety mitigation practices, including physical distancing, hand washing, and respiratory etiquette and health operations. We continue to work with our health partners regarding masking for unvaccinated persons. CDC indicates that when a person wears a mask, they protect others as well as themselves. In accordance with CDC requirements, masks must be worn while students are on the bus, school bus. While we acknowledge that wearing a mask is a personal choice, we recommended that all unvaccinated persons wear masks indoors and outdoors when not socially distanced. To support comfortable norms of our younger students, we also ask that masks are worn in situations where volunteers are in the presence of students younger than 12 years of age, as vaccinations are not yet an option for them. Out of an abundance of caution, 
we are developing a plan of response to shifting metrics in collaborations with our health experts. As with any emergency plan, our hope is to have, our hope is not have to use it, but we also know the importance of being prepared. With that being said, there's nothing better than walking our halls and hearing the voices of students, teachers, and staff feeling the air. I know that I'm not alone in this sentiment. This is why we continue to work tirelessly to give our students the rich learning environments they are accustomed to and deserve while ensuring their safety. Next slide. As shared in the spring, Educational Resource Strategies has identified five power strategies grounded in years of research on how to best support students' academic and social-emotional development. They prioritize strategies that can be sustained over time and support improved student outcomes. The five strategies, empowering adaptive instruction, time and attention, the teaching job, the relationships and social emotional supports, and family and community partnerships. Using CARES grant and ESSA funding, we're implementing these strategies in a variety of ways, including the following efforts for the fall. Summer programs, funding for year two teacher summer onboarding, summer re-engagement opportunities for students, additional 15 minutes of daily instruction, access to intensive tutoring for students, increased staff development school support to secondary schools, focus on new and provisionally certified teachers, increased prayer professional staffing at the elementary school level to support small group instruction in lingu English language arts and math, increased teacher staffing at the secondary level to re reduce class sizes in English and mathematics, year-long professional learning plan for paraprofessionals, teachers, teacher leaders, school administrators, central office leadership aligned with identified system priorities and enhance new principal support. Next slide. So we will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS about our fall opening plan. Today's report is based on the information we have right now. As we have learned, things continue to shift and move based on changing conditions. We look forward to providing a full presentation on opening of schools in August and will share updates as they become available. We also will share additional information that we receive from the Maryland Health Department, the Maryland State Department of Education, and our local partners. This concludes my report. Thank you for that. And so the next report is um, the chair's report. And um, I would like to echo what Dr. Williams said and to um, welcome Christian um, to his first board meeting. Happy to have you. And we look forward to all the exciting things you will bring to us. <laughs> so um, I would also like to um, thank everyone for um, for for coming and um, for participating in our in our board meeting, um, I'm looking forward to the my iPass presentation, uh, as I'm sure um, several of us all are, and I know that we have a lot to get to. So I will go ahead and let Christian speak because you're next on the agenda. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams, board members, the public and students of BCPS. I can honestly say that when trying to come up with something to write about for my first ever small report, I had no idea what to say. Should I start off explaining what an honor this is, how excited I am, and how ready I am get to get to work, because I truly am? Or would it be better to share bits of my platform and explain why I'm here? I just didn't really know what to say. And that's because there really is only one thing to say, and that is that I'm disappointed. I am disappointed that as a student of BCPS for 12 years now, going on 13, the state of this board was governing my education. The state of this board was making decisions about my future. I am disappointed that so many of you are far more concerned about your political outlook and how your constituents would feel about your decisions that you've lost sight of the true understanding of why you're here on the Board of Education. And that is for me, for students like me, 
for all 115,000 of us across this county, not just within a certain district. Now, over the past few months, as I've been preparing to join you all, I've been watching. I've watched every business meeting and work session, most of the committee meetings, and I've talked with so many of you. And the only word to sum up my understanding of this board is that we are broken. The divide that exists on this board is so apparent, and so many of you are not doing anything to fix it. We're screaming at individuals, bashing one another behind closed doors, refusing to collaborate on anything, and we show little respect for our students and for the staff that we are supporting. And, you know, what's even more disappointing than just this divide is that all of you see it. All of you recognize how divided this board is. So many of you have explained to me how bad it is. Yet, where is the action to stop this? And that inaction is what's truly heartbreaking because that is what has had the most devastating impacts on my education and on the education of so many of my peers. Do you realize the lack of attention, lack of responsibility, and lack of duty that each of you carries on this board ha has on our future? Do you actually realize the effect every decision this board has on us? Because it doesn't seem like it. We need you. We need you to fight for us, the students. We need you to fight for our future, our voices, our passions. We need you to listen to us, to seek and elevate our voices, and to actually see what is needed for our success. Because all I've been hearing is a repetition of the same concerns from the same people who speak at every public comment. I'm ashamed that this board has come to this state. Before coming on this board, you all let us get this divided. You allow these factions to be created, and you are the reason that we are focusing far more on fighting one another than fighting for the students. Now, with that being said, I know that all of you started this journey for the right reasons. None of you came to this board expecting there to be a divide. None of you joined this board to work in chaos. You all came here wanting to advance our education system with such unique passions that I've had the pleasure of getting to understand by talking with each of you. Individually, you have all welcomed me to the board so great, and it is an honor to be here, and I am excited to get to work. But that's what we should be doing, working. Working towards a better future for all of us students, working towards a better society for us to live in, and working to create an education system that we can all be proud of. Board members, I am an optimist, as I'm sure many of you will learn over the next year. And I am confident that with a little more listening on both sides and a little more understanding and empathy, we can fix this Board of Education and refocus our attention onto the students of VCPS. Thank you. Well said, Christian. Thank you. Wonderful. Like I said, <laughs> we're looking forward to you bringing great things to us. <laughs> okay. So um, the next item on the agenda is item L. The um, Yep, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Ms. Scott. In closed session, the board deliberated in its quasi-judicial capacity on cases number HE 21-09 and 21-17. Now would be an appropriate time for the board to approve the actions it had taken in closed session. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved, Mac. Second, Hen. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstaining. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? Abstain. Thank you. Thank you. There's seven. Uh, favor is nine. Favor is nine. Thank you. So the um, motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Persides. The next item on the agenda is a consideration of a privately funded capital project for Gunpowder Elementary School. And for that, I call on Dr. Roberts. Dr. Williams and members of the board. Joining me virtually this evening are Principal of Gunpowder Elementary School, Ms. Wendy Cunningham, 
and PTA member Ms. Kirsten Roller. This evening, I bring forward for approval a fo privately funded capital improvement project to build a reading area of a recently grant funded revitalized playground at Gunpowder Elementary School. The reading area is paid for by the Gunpowder Elementary School PTA. And the new reading area is the first phase of the Officer Amy Caprio Playground Project, which when completed, will consist of several upgrades to the playground area. On May 21st, 2018, Officer Caprio lost her life in the line of duty protecting citizens of Baltimore County. More specifically, her brave actions and ultimate sacrifice protected the children that attend Gunpowder Elementary School. In addition, Officer Caprio was an avid reader and lover of the outdoors and animals. The value of the donation is $30,000. This will cover the installation, materials, equipment, fees, and overhead associated with building the reading area. The installation of the new reading area will facilitate students' literacy skills and strive to inspire students to become more virtuous and conscientious. For students who enjoy a quiet outdoor play area, the reading area will be designated place for them to connect with peers or a good book. Game time, care of Cunningham Recreation, will be installing the reading area for the school. The quote and design guidelines have been approved by the BCPS Department of Facilities Management. And following board approval, the estimated time for completion is four months. So in accordance with policy and rule 7330, this request has progressed through all normal internal processes of review. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. May I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for Gunpowder Elementary School's reading area? So moved, Hen. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Causey. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The motion carries. The next item, let me get this here. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the Watershed Public Charter School contract extension. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas. Good evening, Chair Scott and uh, Dr. Williams and members of the board. It's good to be here this evening with you in person. Uh, I have the opportunity this evening to bring forward uh, to you a request for us to extend the four-year contract with our Watershed Public Charter School um, in light of the impact of the pandemic. This proposal is in keeping with what is happening uh, across this the state um, with LEAs who also have charter schools. Uh, this proposal is brought forward on behalf of um, staff and uh, Watershed Public Charter School. Thank you. Is that That's okay? It. All right. <laughs> Sorry. No, no <laughs> more. To double check. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve the Watershed Public Charter School contract extension to June 30th, 2024? So moved. So moved. Causey. So moved. Causey. Is there a second? Second row. Okay. I believe that was Ms. Rose. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, is there any discussion? Yes, um, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Chair Scott. Um, Dr. McComas, when was the original contract scheduled to be uh, expired? Yes, ma'am. The original contract uh, was originally scheduled to uh, run from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2023. We are proposing that it run um, now through June 30th of 2024. So a one-year extension. Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, next is Ms. Mack. Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Dr. McComas, and um, other information, which I'm having trouble getting to, um, there, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. There is information about Watershed Public Charter School and the renewal process. Yes. 
Does this vote negate that process? Is it in, in conjunction with that process, or is it a totally separate process? That is a totally separate process. The process I'm bringing this evening is about the length of the contract that we have with Watershed. The information item that you have um, fulfills our work in Section 15.1 of the contract, which indicate that we would work in partnership with Watershed to to map out that renewal process. So they really are separate um, items, but we wanted to make sure that uh, they both came forward. The uh, renewal process was already, um, um, it, it wasn't for approval because it was already embedded in the contract in section 15.1. But I see in this information um, document that the school will be in a position of getting points based on achievement of certain goals. Will they also be given grace for the fact that we just went through a pandemic and we know that all of our students in all schools have struggled, or will they be expected to have achieved these goals regardless of the pandemic? Right, um, so I think the grace would be in the extension of the contract. Okay. Okay, I understand. Yes. Thank you. So okay. instead of okay. reaching, okay. right, instead of reach just for the good of everyone, instead of reaching those goals in four years, we recognize that the pandemic, there was not state assessment, there was a lot uh, that occurred, and so that is why we're bringing forward the extension to provide more adequate time. But we just heard Dr. Williams talk about the fact that recovery and healing was going to be a long process. Will we extend to them the same courtesy that we're extending to all of our other students for that recovery and healing process? So, Ms. Mack, let me respond to that. Watershed is a part of our school system. Okay. So what we will do with all schools, that is, includes Watershed Public Charter School. So That's yes. the answer I needed. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. 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 McComas. Any additional questions? Yes, Ms. Colsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, earlier we had a... Uh, public uh, comment speaker address funding uh, related to watershed. Is that an item that um, Dr. Williams, you could provide an update to the board in the future? Yes, uh, I can. I just want to emphasize again that watershed is a part of our school system. And, and so I'll end it right there and, and we'll be happy to follow up with your request, Ms. Causey. Thank you. We appreciate your clarification. <laughs> Any additional questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, Ms. Gilbert may have a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors 11. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Joe's chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Earlier today, the Building and Contracts Committee met and reviewed and processed 14 contracts. Some of these contracts are time sensitive. Um, all of these contracts were approved unanimously by the committee and are, is coming to the full board for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N14? So moved, Hen. So moved. Thank you, I heard Ms. Hen. Moved it. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, earlier I had uh, sent in questions into buildings and contracts because I was unable to attend in person. And I just wondered if there could be a brief um, recap of the questions related to evaluations, vendor evaluations. Excuse me, Ms. Causey. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. We can't hear you. Can you? repeat what you said into your microphone? Certainly. And I don't think it's turned on. It has the green light, so. I can hear you. Thanks, okay. Russ. Maybe I'll just try to speak up. Is that better? Yeah. They can hear you. Okay. Maybe turn off your computer mic. Yes, let me. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay, is that better? 
Thank you. Um, so earlier I had sent in um, questions related to the contracts and related specifically to um, vendor evaluations, just asking uh, what was the rationale around several of the contracts having repeat vendors or prior vendors being uh, renewed contracts or increase in, in, in the spending authority of contracts, but there was no um, vendor evaluation. So I'm just wondering, is there a criteria um, that wasn't hit in terms of a dollar value or a time frame? And the reason I'm asking those questions is uh, the policy related to vendor evaluation is coming uh, forward this evening in the policy segment. So uh, in some cases, the contracts did not uh, reach the $500,000 threshold for an evaluation. Uh, in most cases, they were new contracts and the current policy uh, provides for vendor evaluations uh, at the conclusion of a contract. Um, no contract is presented to this board uh, for any vendor whose performance has been unsatisfactory. And I would like to discuss with the superintendent and the Office of Law the the request that that was made to provide the actual vendor evaluations as part of the package so um, and I can go through any individual contracts that you had questions about but that's those were the I think each of them fell into one of those three groupings so for instance contract jmi-619-16 um actually that's not the one i'm looking for jmi-618-18 information technology staffing surfaces um right. so in it it's a currently an 11 million dollar spending authority and the modification request is three million eight hundred twenty five thousand um and one of the th things that's interesting about the contract is there's 58 vendors, 58 vendors. Thank you. Um, so it would, as a board member, it would be helpful to understand when we're having repeat contracts or major increases in value that, you know, we understand that the evaluation has been done. So, um, it, so go ahead. Sorry. No, so it, it's just one of the, um, kind of a check the bark, check the box um, thing. So I appreciate your comments about um, staff understanding that or, or saying that they are bringing vendors that do not have issues, but that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as going through a systemic vendor evaluation. Right, and in many cases, with the current system, the the uh, managing office doesn't submit an evaluation, and when that happens, we take it to mean that it, the performance has been acceptable, but we still survey every contract uh, that comes up for evaluation. Uh, another uh, issue with that particular contract is it's, I believe, 2018 through 2023, so under the current policy it hasn't come up for evaluation but um, in terms of the the detail there there's 58 vendors basically uh, and I've used s some of those vendors uh, Department of Technology and research and accountability are the primary users for IT professional contractors and what happens is that we reach out uh, to the vendors on the list that are uh, have made proposals for the skill set that we're looking for. They send us a list of resumes. We interview those uh, professionals. We hire them, and if their performance is unsatisfactory, we replace them. And so uh, we have more interaction on a personal level with the candidates than we do with the agency with whom the contract exists. But 
uh, and there, are, at any point in the year, there are between 20 and 30 of those professionals on that list. Okay, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. It looks like there's a... No, I, um, I believe Mr. Kuhn. Yes, thank you. Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I, I was in, I, I voted to move these things forward. Um, I did want to point out uh, one thing that seemed uh, that, that we should all be aware of. Uh, ARA 200-22, off-site forest planting. Um, there was only one vendor because there is only one vendor in Baltimore County that actually has a forest uh, or, this, or provides this forest planting and um, buffer mitigation uh, as outlined uh, by the county. So the other thing um, that I, I had asked staff about and I wanted to highlight to the board was we can actually do plantings ourselves uh, on land that we own in, in various areas if we go through the steps to you know get certified to basically build a forest uh, in, in various areas. So we have significant land holdings in areas um, and schools across the county. So we may want to look into this so we can avoid the $1.2 million that have been set aside <clears throat> to pay for this. So I just wanted to share that. I, I, don't, um, I don't have a problem at all with that, but that's a very interesting um, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Next is Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I also want to just state that some of these questions were answered during our committee meeting. And once again, I just want to put it on documented that board members can send their questions uh, to the Building and Contracts Committee for any questions you have in the contracts. Those contracts are posted a week in advance. Um, it was just fair for staff that they have some time to respond to elaborate questions. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. And I would like to thank the committee for doing the heavy lift and explaining um, a lot of that and all the hard work that you all do um, on the contracts committee. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the revised 2021-2022 school calendar. And for that, I call on Mr. Duke. Good evening, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. The amended 2021 school calendar is being presented for the board's consideration and approval. The calendar was modified to allow high schools to close three hours early at the end of each quarter and on the last two du uh, duty days of the school year. In the past, high schools have been kept in session on the last days of each quarter and on the last two days of the school year in order to ensure that the school system met the state required number of high school student contact hours. With the addition of the 15 minutes to the student day, this problem has been minimized. Releasing the high schools three hours early along with the elementary and middle schools will provide the high school teachers time for end of quarter grade reporting as well as data analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, may I have a motion to approve the revised 2021 to 2022 school calendar? Uh, Ms. Scott, uh, can we have discussion about this? Yes, so we have discussion after the motion is, um, after there's a motion and then a second, then we have discussion. Okay, thank you. So moved, Matt. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Yes, uh, Christian, or sorry, Mr. Thomas, wait. Thomas, sorry. Okay. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. 
All right, so um, I was looking at the calendar, and for the religious holiday of Eid, um, which is Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022, um, that holiday is currently recognized as a professional development day. And I have a little bit of a concern with that because um, not only, I guess, for this holiday, students would, yes, have off school and they wouldn't be required to attend school, but um, for the teachers that are identified as Muslim and do celebrate this holiday, um, they're not they would have to take a religious leave, which I don't know the policy or any of the procedures along with that, because I'm still new to the board. Um, but I think that professional development is really important to teachers, and I, I think that that time can be used very valuably. And I'm just concerned that uh, a large a portion of our teachers would be unable to participate in professional development on that day because they'd be celebrating this holiday. So um, that's kind of the comment that I had there, if that made sense. Yes, thank you. Would you like to... Uh, Mr. Duke, I know we've we've had previous conversation. You want to get some context to that? Um, the board, uh, in its policy, recommended that the professional development day be observed on the religious holidays for the Jewish and the Muslim faith if they fell on a, on a school day, and that is the procedure that we've been following for the last few years. Um, the professional development uh, is not. Um, Teachers are not penalized for missing the professional development, and it is recommended that the professional development be provided to the individual teachers uh, in a um, handout format or online format for them to um, be able to participate or um, benefit from the professional development. So they do have the opportunity to um, get information from their professional development Correct. if they miss. Okay, um, thank you. Any ad additional questions or discussion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I just wanted to thank um, Mr. Duke and the calendar committee for the work that they do. Um, they meet and quite often and way ahead of time to start planning for the prior year. So I appreciate that. And I'm just grateful that um, with the um, funding of the 15 minutes extra a day that it is, allows the school system additional flexibility. So I just wanted to point out that, that was um, something that this board and this superintendent um, really um, implemented and made sure that we could get the funding for that. So I just appreciate the work of the board and the superintendent and the work of staff in um, having this more flexible schedule for our students and our teachers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it looks like there's a question from Ms. Rowe. Yes, uh, Mr. Duke, could you please explain to me, one of the things that we've heard a few years in a row is that the reason we can't start school after Labor Day without getting rid of spring break or having some other restrictions on our calendar flexibility is because we didn't have that 15 minutes. And now we have the 15 minutes, so I would like to know currently what is stopping us from opening school after Labor Day. Well, there are a lot of considerations that go into play when we develop the calendar. The recommendation that was made to the board um, included two options for this calendar. One was a pre and one was a post. The decision of the board was that we would go with the pre-Labor uh, Day start uh, rather than the post-holiday start for the 2021 school year. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the 21-22 school year. Um, you have to recall that the later we start the school year, the later the school year will end, which is another consideration that the board takes into account. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, concerns around um, the uh, 4-H students being able to attend the, um, the uh, state fair. Um, there are also, on the other side of the, the coin, there are concerns of, of those parents who have uh, students participating in sports at the high school level who return um, to the area and are involved in practices uh, well in early August and then don't benefit from uh, the school year being delayed beyond um, Labor Day. So there are a lot of considerations um, that go into play uh, when that decision is made. It also uh, comes into play as to when Labor Day um, lands on a calendar. Some years it is early in September and we've had um, in most recent uh, time uh, where Labor Day has uh, uh, landed in the second week of September, which then pushes the end of the school year further into June. 
I see. So it's primarily because this year it lands in Labor Day lands in the second week of September. Well, I think that one of the other considerations that the board took into play was the pandemic and getting our students back into the into the classrooms earlier than later. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes, Ms. Cozzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we all received an email, I believe, from um, Dr. Bosch Verone, um, who's on the calendar committee. So they're already meeting about next year. So um, that's one of the things that's being discussed is the objective value of a post Labor Day start and a pre Labor Day start. So um, what we did this year does not necessarily impact uh, the decision that could be made next year. So that's something that's being um, discussed right now. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scover, um, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Ms. Yes. Pasteur? Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. I do just want to comment. I want to thank Mr. Duke and the team because if you notice the format of the calendar was an upgrade um, where it keeps the number of days students are in school as well as staff. So thank you, Mr. Duke, and to, and to the team. Yes, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 1320, contest sponsored contests sponsored by external organizations. Policy 2372, tobacco free and smoke free school environment. Policy 3231, Vendor Performance Evaluation. Policy 5420, Health Services. Policy 5430, Psychological Services. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit P. I'm sorry, Q? I apologize. It's presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit Q. <laughs> Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved. Was that yeah. Chris? Okay, Thomas. thank you. Mr. Thomas. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Ms. Causey? Thank you, Ms. Scott. I just wanted to spend a few minutes on policy 3231, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. So as we heard earlier uh, from Mr. Saris um, around procurement, um, that currently the board policy does not specify um, a time frame or a dollar value um, by which vendor evaluation should be done. Currently, it's done at the end of a contract, but if that contract is $15 million and four years long, does it really make sense to um, have that lack of clarity in our policy? Um, so I would like to um, make a motion to include and I apologize, um, my laptop is not working, so I had this in my um, other laptop, so I'm, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not able to get into the meeting, so I'm, I can't get to the chat. Um, uh, that it would include, include um, that a vendor analysis would be done after one year, or, and I wanted to ask staff for their opinion of a dollar value that would be reasonable. Um, we have so many contracts. Obviously, this doesn't need to be busy work, but where there are issues of um, significant dollar values or significant, uh, sometimes there's new initiatives, um, that it's helpful to have those vendor evaluations before um, spending continues or there might need to be a modification or um, <clears throat> to, to that contract. Um, so I was wondering if I, Dr. Williams, could ask staff for a dollar value um, or just uh, set what the board could determine one. I'm sorry, I just have a point of clarification. Are you 
making a motion to add language to policy 3231? Yes. Okay, but you're saying you're not able to, well, I guess my question would also be is that since it was already um, moved and we're about to vote on it, wouldn't it require separating that one out to then send it back to committee to add the language? Um, well, in policy review, we did um, hear from staff that policies can be amended in the meeting mm -hmm. or they can be sent back to PRC. So then so, is your request then to send it back to PRC no, and have it amended I, there or you want to amend it here? Um, in order to um, be efficient and try and move the policy forward, um, I would want to amend it here, I mean, pending the approval of the full board. Hmm. Okay, um, because I know you are in policy and review, so I would have expected the language to be amended there so that we could move it through here, but you want to do committee work in the full assembly. Sometimes um, as I've opposed not to the committee, able to um, do the working committee. So. That's unfortunate then. Yes. Um, so then I would ask uh, Mr. Mercedes, um, if there is language, which I still haven't heard it yet, um, that you would like to add, um, it looks like, is that what you put in, Ms. Rowe? The language that you, Ms. Calzy, is suggesting? I wrote, I wrote exactly what she said. Vendor analysis would be done after one year and ask staff for a dollar value that would be reasonable to include in the policy. Okay, this is very um, much. Um, I just okay. typed it because she can't get into the chat, so I just typed exactly what she said. Madam Chair, if it's more to the uh, board's pleasure, we can just vote to table this and we can um, process it at the next meeting, this one, pol this one policy. I think that would be most prudent, and then you would be able to actually put the language in directly yourself, because I, I don't want to... Yes, and as I mentioned, doing a my board laptop's not working, so I don't have access to the postpone? Okay. documents. Okay, so then you would make a motion to postpone the approval of policy 3231? Yes. Okay. Does that require a second? Yep. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. Okay. So we're going to postpone um, the approval of policy. Thir well, actually, do we need to take a vote on that? I'm sorry. Okay. Let's, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote on um, postponing 3231. Were there any questions about that? Yes, Ms. Joes. Ms. God, there's a motion on the floor already. Oh, that is true. Yes. The motion was to move all of these forward. So then can we postpone? I guess, Mr. Brusades, are you there? This would be a legal question. Yes, good, e good evening. If, good evening, sir. If we've already have a motion um, to accept the recommendations of the PRC to move all of the policies forward, can we then pull out and postpone uh, individual policy after we've already made a motion to move them you, forward? The, the, the motion could be amended to, to pull out 3231. Okay, so she's amending the motion to pull out 3231. Right. Okay. And postpone it to the next meeting. And postpone it to the next meeting. Okay. Um, if you could state that, please, Ms. Causey, so we can... <laughs> Certainly, Madam Chair. I move that we pull out policy 3231 and postpone it until the next board meeting. Peter, I, I thought it was a next policy review meeting. You want to... I'll email staff they can reply and then it will be prepared for the next board meeting. The next board meeting. Okay. Is there a second for that? Second, Thomas. Okay. Any um, questions? I actually have a question. Um, so, Ms. Causey, uh, where in the policy would this language be implemented? Or I guess I'm, I, I think it's important that we do address pulling this out since you're bringing up concerns about it. Um, I, but where, is there a specificity to where in, in the policy? Yeah. Certainly. It would be a standard. It, Can you define a standard? Certainly. So, um, for instance, standard A is vendors should receive feedback on their performance, whether it is positive or negative. In the case of negative feedback, the vendor shall be informed of why their performance is unsatisfactory and what corrective action is required. So it would be we would add a standard that would say uh, related to the dollar value and the time frame because we don't want to require staff to do work on very small <clears throat> contracts, um, but we've had significant contracts, tens of millions of dollars that were not evaluated until the end because it's policy. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
So, um, Ms. Gover, if we could then do a roll call vote, and we're voting on um, the amendment to the motion. Is that correct? Actually, can I make another comment? Oh, yes, please go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say um, that I do believe in, in a regular board meeting that this kind of stuff should be established in the policy review committee. Mm -hmm. However, we do not have a committee meeting, any committee meetings until come, what is it, next September. September. So I think that it, uh, because of the special, this meeting is a special meeting, it's both a business meeting and a work session combined, and because we don't have another committee meeting, uh, that's why I support addressing this now. Thank, Thank you. you. So I just wanted to clarify, so Ms. Gover, we're um, voting on the motion as amended um, to pull out 3231. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? Ms. Pester? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Pester? Thank you. Okay, it looks like it's in favor of seven. Eight. Thank you. Okay, so that, um, so then uh, the Motion carries, and so then um, th 32, 31 um, will be reviewed um, at the next, or postponed, excuse me, to the next board meeting. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the, excuse me, oh, I'm sorry, it's moving forward, I apologize. <laughs> so may I have a roll call vote, please, on the motion? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Now we can move on. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit. Okay, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. So tonight we are here to go over final recommendations for the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. I'm joined virtually uh, by Mr. Dixit, who is going to frame uh, the presentation and also introduce the presenter. So, uh, Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Scriven, and good evening, Chair Ms. Scott, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. And welcome aboard, Mr. Thomas Christian. Um, uh, uh, I can see you bring a lot of zeal and excitement to the board meeting, and I wish you all the best. So as the board is aware, BCPS, in collaboration with Baltimore County government, has been working with Canon Design in developing a multi-year plan for all schools. This is the multi-year plan for capital improvements to all schools. It has been a transparent, and collaborative and a participatory process, which has been going on for 15 months now. And there were six focus groups, five stakeholder advisory committees, and three community forums in phase two alone. In phase one, we had interactive sessions on enrollment projections. We had two adequacy and equity meetings and two facility condition assessment. In addition to that, there, there were two surveys in phase one, and there was another survey in phase one. All of that information from the survey has been live on BCPS and BCG website for most of the time. 
Phase one recommendations were presented to the board in the meeting of September 29, and some of those recommendations were incorporated in our state submission last year. Tonight, we are back here again for the second phase and the final phase of my iPass. So without stealing any thunder, I'm going to introduce once again Mr. Paul Mills, Senior Vice President of Canon Design, to present the final presentation to the board and answer any questions that board members may have. So with that, Mr. Mills. Good evening, uh, Board Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Mr. Thomas, welcome, esteemed board members and um, Dr. Williams and staff and community members um, observing. Uh, we're here tonight to present final recommendations for the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. I'm Paul Mills with Canon Design, and I'm joined as always by Dr. David Lever of Educational Facilities Planning, a team member of our team. Where we off, um, left off last time we met was in May, in which, um, to refresh everyone's memories, we walked through a series of facility options, draft options, that had been developed transparently and um, collaboratively with an inclusive process that included um, over 100 uh, uh, stakeholders involved, directly involved in the development of these plans, as well as consultation of the community at large. You'll recall that we had grouped schools among geographically um, proximate clusters of schools, and we created series of option A, B, C, et cetera, for all of these facilities that were out there. Tonight, um, since our last conversation, wanted to share with you what we've been up to and what leads us to these final recommendations that we're presenting tonight. First, we had four special education and alternative education stakeholder workshops. These were in-depth focused workshops looking at the specific needs of these vital programs that exist in eight different um, specialty centers that are distributed around the county as well as within all 170 campuses across um, the entire county. We had members from our design practice that focus on behavioral and mental health design in the healthcare space for clinical sorts of facilities that brought a different perspective into the educational space with some very lively and focused conversations that have informed our final recommendations. We also had the May 27th Community Forum with dozens of members of the community attending in an interactive workshop in which we had breakout rooms for each of the five geographies on a rotating basis so members could attend and participate in um, a listening session as well as some open dialogue and Q&A sessions on all or any of the particular geographies in which they had an interest. We also conducted a, a statewide, um, sorry, BP, um, BCPS conducted a countywide survey in which nearly 5,000 participants responded. And I'm proud to say that there were um, responses from all of Baltimore County public schools, school communities represented. We also worked hard on cost estimating um, to make sure that whatever final plans and recommendations that we're preparing are something that you can live up to at the end of the day. So promises made to the community are promises that can be fulfilled. We also held one final focus group summit, which is a workshop interactive in which we looked at the responses from the community, as well as all of the data um, and dollars associated with delivering all these projects and gained valuable insight to inform our final recommendations. So as before, I'll just clearly state that um, our, our role as Canon Design, as professional consultants working with you, just like we do with school systems all around the country. While we do have a Baltimore office with a number of families that have um, students that attend your schools, and we do have a stake in the process, that we're brought to you as professionals to be objective and to provide unvarnished professional recommendations that were not guided by internal influences whatsoever. So this is objective and third party. We're gonna structure the presentation this evening along these lines here. We're gonna do a quick recap of the purpose of my path, particularly for those who might be observing this presentation for the first time. We'll speak a little bit about the people and process that led to this point, the results of this work, 
our recommendations and then I look forward into next steps. The purpose of the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, that this is a capital improvement program plan, um, but in the all intents is to create and carve forward a long range capital roadmap that's predictable and data driven. One that maximizes state funding that's available to Baltimore County Public Schools. One that's comprehensive and student focused in nature. And by virtue of comprehensive, this refers to the fact that this um, is one of the first studies in Baltimore County that really looked at things through multiple lenses in terms of capacity utilization, looking at the enrollment projections compared to the capacities of your schools in a way that's refreshed, as well as looking at the physical health of the buildings. We had teams of architects and engineers that reviewed all of your campuses um, out there from, we like to say, fence line to fence line, from the foundation up to the rooftop, looking at the physical health of all the systems and cataloging all of these deficiencies um, both in terms of what has reached the end of its useful life today and also a look ahead um, with professional judgment of what's coming down the pike in the near future. And we're really proud of the, the other third pillar of educational adequacy and equity. We looked at things in terms of comparing your existing buildings that many were built decades ago compared to the standard of what you would build today with a new facility. We also took it a step further and looked at not just equality of brick and mortar or like for like buildings, but also the relative needs of all the students that are um, attending the schools to create an, um, a framework that delivers equity, that helps, that acknowledges the fact that students have different needs that are out there and they have varying needs of supports with a tailored approach that provides facility ports, supports that support all the wraparound services that Baltimore County Public School, Schools aspires to deliver. Another facet is that, it, um, as um, Mr. Dixit was implying, that this was an inclusive or included inclusive stakeholder and community engagement as part of the process. At the end of the day, what this is about and what we've been charged with providing you is a professional recommendation, a roadmap looking forward um, for equitable allocation of limited resources that are available. And I was describing earlier in the educational adequacy and equity assessment, we're really looking at achieving, and we've learned by collaborating with your departments and your leadership, we've evolved in our own thinking about how we deliver these services. And we've created something here that is unique in this industry, and we're providing something that you can be very proud of. So what this plan is in the whole life cycle of doing things, and we share this with you to compare what this might be compared to other studies that you've experienced um, throughout the course Excuse of me, your... We are not seeing your presentation. If you, I don't know if you know it or not, your presentation is not on the screen. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. All right. That's some pretty pictures of your lovely children. Um, throughout Thank the you, Dr. Hager, for pointing that out. <laughs> Thank you for lifting that up. So the multi-year improvement plan for all schools is one of several types of studies that you experience in your stewardship over our capital improvement programs. Um, over the life cycle, if you will, um, starting with long range planning, going through some focused due diligence through the funding process and into project implementation, numerous studies happen. And we wanted to share with you how the multi-year improvement plan for all schools is um, distinct from some of the other types. So if you look at the long range planning element, that's where we are in this stage, but it addresses critical questions. What we're charged with um, uh, facilitating a dialogue around is the question of how do we strategically and equitably invest limited budgets across all schools over a reasonable time frame. Now we're going to be recommending some further due diligence as part of this look ahead here and we'll be looking a little step further on particular um, large big picture very impactful questions that we might look at things like should we build a new high school or expand existing ones what kinds of programs should it offer and where could we possibly build it there's another type of study and we know that there are two that are pending that have been commissioned by baltimore county um, and that's for a state required feasibility study, which is used in the funding process. And it's distinct from the sorts of questions that we've been asked to address. Um, and it's really focused and specific and it's procedural. 
the sorts of questions would be along the lines of would a renovation or demolition and replacement be financially viable for a specific site looking focusing on one particular site in one set of circumstances whether or not you could afford it compared to a, a multi-year improvement plan that looks at the needs of all schools all told now when you get into the project implementation stage there are other types of studies you'll see in terms of aligning the budgets and scopes and to invest more time with design professionals to um, do more than just a facility assessment, but rather get in and determine what the project ought to be before getting into design. We share this all just to frame the notion of what this process is about. So people in process is involved. I'm not gonna walk you through blow by blue, the structure of all the committees um, involved, but the numbers tell the story. Um, categorically, this has been a successful engagement as evidenced by the fact that over 25,000 stakeholders have um, lended their voice into contributing towards um, the recommendations we're putting forward today. Over 100 people have directly been involved, not just on one occasion, but rather participated in an iterative um, process in which they looked through 22 different planning workshops, understanding a mutual understanding of what the guiding principles and goals of the district and, and this plan ought to be and developing or understanding all the data around the facility assessments and developing a series of these draft options that were put forward to your community. So the results of the work, um, I'm gonna allow Dr. Lever to take over from here. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the results from the survey that was conducted. Um, Mr. Mills spoke earlier about a purpose of the MyPass process was the equitable allocation of limited resources. We wanted to see what the community thought of that. And so we asked a question, funding for facilities should be allocated to benefit as many students as possible. And there was an overwhelming response. 91% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that resources should be allocated to benefit as many students as possible. That basically affirms <laughs> our own position as professionals, the way that we've entered this process and the basic purpose that we have in conducting this uh, study. Another question that we asked relates to the reasonable implementation timeline. And we asked, what's the longest that students should go without a major building renovation in anticipation of receiving a replacement school. What we discovered is that 82% prefer that that time frame should be 15 years or less, which is also a reasonable time frame that we as professionals think a capital pro program of this kind should extend. A small group, about 7%, thought that it could go to about 20 years. And then a certain group felt that there didn't need to be a limit at all, about 12%. And it seems that given that majority that favors less than 15 years, there's a kind of recognition that time itself is an aspect of equity, that if a project is delayed for too long, that it's as if it was actually denied to students in the community who need that project and they won't receive the benefit of it. And so there is a certain time frame within which it's very reasonable to conduct these projects and to try and get them done. Our third question had to do with a set of questions actually that focused on achieving equitable access to education, opportunities to maximize academic success and social and emotional well-being. And the results here I think were very interesting. 100% of the respondents felt that there should be access to academic opportunities and programs. And we read into that 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 means for every child. Um, a substantial majority, 91%, felt that every student should have a seat inside the building. That means not in a relocatable classroom or a modular building, but in permanent construction. And then, as you would expect, a very large number were in favor of safe and supportive environment for the children. The next bar, I think, is particularly interesting because Although there's still a substantial majority, 71%, it's a, a drop in the total number. And the question was, all aspects of the show, facility in top condition. And it seems that what this reflects is a recognition 
that if you tried to put all aspects of all facilities into top condition, this is at works against the notion of that every student should have a seat inside the building, all students should have that access to academic opportunities and programs. And we recognize that facilities are an important aspect of that access to academic opportunities and programs. And it may even work against the notion that every student should be in a safe and supportive environment. And so there's a certain conflict that emerges here, and I think that is reflected in the numbers. Uh, Mr. Mills talked about our efforts at cost estimating, and I'll go into a bit of detail here. The cost estimates were based on the facility assessments and industry standard practices. We included all costs. That means we included contingency costs, and we also included uh, soft costs. Uh, the assessments that were done to determine the scope of the work were based on parametric requirements. So every school was treated the same. Uh, the scope was determined through study of the documents, through survey of the principals, and through limited on-site observation. The purpose of it was to compare the facilities against a standard set of parameters, always the same for every facility. And as uh, Mr. Mills noted, this is not the same kind of information that would be developed if you were undertaking a feasibility study, which is a requirement of the state of Maryland, or the kind of detailed scoping study that's used to, in effect, provide guidance to the architectural engineering team when they begin design. All figures are given in 2021 U.S. dollars, and that'll be true for everything you see in this presentation this evening. But when we carry out our execution plan, which will be actually the step that will lead to the actual CIP, the budget year, CIP, and then the future years, we will provide a uniform construction escalation factors. And because of the strange state that our economy is and the effect it's having on construction, we'll assume a 10% jump in the baseline and then a 4% gradual increase thereafter through the 15 years. And we also will assume that the CI budget will increase over the course of the full 15 years by an average of about 4% per year. So in effect, the expectation is that the CIP budget will keep up with the construction cost escalation. And finally, a very important factor is that when we are determining the size of new construction, that means addition projects and new schools, we were using the per student square foot figures that are emerged from the educational specifications that have been developed by Baltimore County Public Schools that were approved by this Board of Education. We were not using the state of Maryland square foot per student figures, which tend to be smaller. The Baltimore County Public School figures include everything which the board has determined are needed for the educational program for elementary school students, middle school students, and high school students, which include features that go beyond the minimum, which is promoted by the state of Maryland. So the result of this cost estimating is that we came to a total tally of $4.7 billion. It's a staggering number. This would be the number that would emerge if you pursued the highest cost options that have been um, found within this uh, survey. This would include replacements of schools where there are capacity issues. I should note that there's no double counting. In other words, if a school is included in the $4.7 billion for replacement, it means that any renovations that were found at that school have dropped out of the tally, so we avoid double counting. Your budget, however, remember these are present dollars, 2021 dollars. The budget looking forward for 15 years is $2.5 billion. That's $140 million per year for 15 years, consisting of $100 million of county money and $40 million from the state. That reflects the typical allocation that has been approved in recent years. In addition to that, for 10 years, the Built to Learn Act will provide an estimated $400 million to Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, the figure on paper is $462 million. We understand that the total uh, issuance will be less, so we're taking a conservative view here so that we don't 
them establish a budget which is higher and then have to scale back later on. So with that, I'll return it to uh, Mr. Mills who will provide some detail about how the total is broken down and then we'll move into the recommendations. Thank you very much. So clearly we have some needs that outweigh your current budget if you're looking forward to a 15 year um, planning cycle. It's part of it. So our approach to addressing this was not to look at project by project, school by school, or even region by region, but rather look at universal objectives and themes and missions we're trying to accomplish as part of your capital improvement um, program. So we came through and tallied up all of these different options and all the underpinnings of the projects beneath them and categorized them by these objectives you see on the screen here. So I'll walk you through them. Well, first and foremost, as David mentioned earlier, the incremental costs um, of educational strategy projects we'll speak about in a moment and premium projects we'll speak about. Um, there's no double counting. We made sure that we looked at those as a premium up and above some of the other categories. So legacy projects, these are fulfilling promises on projects that are already committed and underway that are partially funded um, and in progress of either design or construction. Um, this includes the schools of our future, or excuse me, schools for our future, as well as the Lansdowne High School project that are on your current CIP. Managed growth is a group of projects that you look at addition renovation type projects along with redistricting that would represent the most economical approach to bringing capacity utilization um, within control. Educational strategy projects are a grouping of projects that are really structural in nature. By that I mean that they speak to new programs, grade reconfiguration, consolidation of campuses, things that affect your portfolio of schools in a profound way that require a very strategic view. Special alternative education projects are, um, is what the name would imply. They speak to new construction and renovations um, for all of your standalone centers, um, as well as supports within um, the campuses around the county. Renovations and enhancements are um, additive to the projects that are the schools that you have out there today. It's closing the gap between the construction built decades ago to what you would build today. Um, and includes more than just repairing broken systems or systems that reach the end of their useful life in terms of the physical health of the buildings really get into the design of the facility in a way that helps foster modern instruction the way you aspire to um, deliver it. Pre-K early education we know is on the horizon with um, recent and very present legislation that's going through the cycle and we've proactively accounted for it in the planning. And then we have a category called premium projects. Um, these would be the sorts of projects like demolishing and replacing facilities um, in lieu of doing additions and renovations or building additions that would enable you to avoid a redistricting scenario, um, capital costs that could potentially be avoided operationally. So closing the budget gap, anyone in the design and construction field is very familiar with that triangle that um, exists that really looks at the dynamic tension between cost, schedule, and quality or scope of work. And that's really the sorts of um, uh, the permutations of thought processes analysis that we had to go through to go through here. So closing that budget gap, a number of ways you could do it. One would be to take longer to do it. It'd be like um, having a longer mortgage on um, your house or a longer payment cycle on buying a car. Well, we could do all this sort of work that's identified as needs and extend it for a longer period of time. And depending on all the bells and whistles and how many of those premium projects we've included, we're pushing it well beyond the 20 years and maybe perhaps even the 30 year sort of cycle to take care of these. And as mentioned earlier, our takeaways from all the community feedback was that that sort of timeline that just really isn't acceptable. And just when you think about just a whole generation of students going through the system, um, it gets beyond the point of, of reasonableness. So another way would be we come up with more money. Let's deliver the same scope along the same time frame, but it might take upwards of 80 million extra a year when you have a traditional spend of 140 million a year, which would be a, a transformative sort of change. Now we do for a short period of time have some additional money, but those already are accounted for in the budgeting that we mentioned in the gap analysis we mentioned. 
Another strategy is looking at um, alternative funding sources that are out there. We know that Prince George's County is right now in undergoing some public-private partnership or P3 delivery of um, some projects. And this is something we're looking at closely. It's new within the United States to deliver schools and um, through this, as opposed to other revenue generating infrastructure, such as highways and those sorts of things. So it is kind of new and you'll see where we have some recommendations along that front. The other way is, is looking at reducing scope, coming up and closing the gap with, okay, we need to be wise about what we can promise and deliver within a reasonable time frame within budgets. So it's things like looking at redistricting as opposed to additions, looking at additions and renovations as opposed to replacement, and to look at the renovations from all the assessment data and deficiencies that are identified and prioritizing those and coming up with um, a prioritized approach to renovations that still achieves transformative outcomes, but perhaps on a little bit limited scale. So our recommendations as part of it, working hard with um, the focus group summit and identifying all these challenges, looking at community feedback and such. We've gone through all of those um, draft options that have gone through and we've determined a way we can actually provide you a recommendation that's one in budget. Two, that touches all schools and provides at very least a prioritized renovation to every single one of the 170 campuses within a reasonable 15 year planning horizon that all legacy projects are included that additions and redistricting are deployed such that with the target year of 2026, 27, that we use as our, our um, enrollment projection planning horizon, that we bring all the capacity utilization down to 100% from in which in many cases exceeds that by um, uh, in some cases even more than double. And that select educational strategy projects that we'll expand upon earlier are included as part of it that there's a heavy investment in special education, alternative education, um, and prioritized renovations and enhancements that touch all schools, as well as a proactive approach to um, the pre-K early education planning. Now you'll note on the chart here, we've got this dotted line here for your 15 year budget. That's that $2.5 million in today's um, uh, state of inflation. This 146 million is a very, uh, broad brushstroke early impact study we've done based on our read of the legislation, the, the blueprint legislation that's in draft form and going through its cycles that still has a lot of question marks on it. But our early impact study suggests that it's probably in the realm of one, perhaps as much as two years of the funding cycle. So as opposed to ratcheting back on the budgets or having to dig deeper into um, your budgets and spend more money, what we're recommending is let's confidently move forward with our recommended scale and scope of budgets, but rather due to the unknown nature of when these requirements are going to hit in the magnitude of them and the proportion that will be covered by private sector versus public, that we treat time as the lever. Now we mentioned that we're planning for a 15 year planning cycle. So what we're talking about is potentially extending that to 16 years, which is a lot more reasonable than looking into that 24 or 30 plus type sort of planning horizon. Now one note um, you'll see here on the drawing here is that the gray band of 723 million estimated for the identified premium projects that came forward through this process are not included, not recommended. So we've talked about big picture strategies in the categorically, how we universally would apply these um, categories in a way that's right for all students and consistent across the entire county. Let's pivot for a second into how does that manifest itself in an actual project? What we're talking about is between three and five new schools. And the variability there is determined by some due diligence we're gonna recommend in just a moment. Um, replacement schools from your slate of, of legacy projects 28 addition renovation projects, 132 uh, prioritized renovations, as well as potential repurposed campuses. But the thing to note here, and this is a breakdown of each school named, and I forgive me if this is hard to see on your screens, but you have the reports, but we have identified for each and every campus within the 15 year horizon that there is a capital project 
so that no student coming through the system will be without some sort of improvements to their built environment. Um, the sequence on here is grouped, as you can see in columns here, by your five planning areas. And then the next um, grouping is by the project type. And then beneath that, the order is sequenced by the, um, the aggregated need score, as you'll recall from the facility assessments, where we looked in composite at the capacity, at the educational adequacy and equity, as well as the condition of the buildings. So the ones towards the top are the ones that measure with higher need, as opposed to the ones at the bottom that were, um, had relatively less needs that are out there. So we looked closely at trade-offs um, as part of this. And as an example, if all of those premium projects, the $723 million that had a lot of, or a handful of um, replacements of schools, as well as some additions um, on where redistricting could resolve it. And there is a, certainly a trade-off. If those projects were to be implemented, the trade-off and the result, the consequence of making that conscious decision would be that 86 out of the 170 campuses, nearly half, or precisely half, um, would be without any sort of improvements over a 15-year sort of cycle. We did the community surveys in which we asked which of the options, option A, option B, option C, which of these could you support? And voters could vote on any or all of these. It wasn't a mutual exclusive scenario, pick your favorite. It was, could you understand and support option A? Could you understand and support option B, et cetera, down the line? And um, categorically, almost universally across the entire county, with the messaging of trade-offs associated with the selected scopes, um, uh, that underpinned each of those options, almost in every single count, the participants that identify themselves with those areas um, and looking at the survey results supported the more economical options, the ones that we're recommending as part of it, with the sole exception in the central area where um, the high school options were put forward. Option A was for additions and renovations um, to accommodate the growth that's been experienced in that area and projects to continue. Option B was to replace Delaney and Towson High Schools at a larger scale with renewed facilities. The way the, the graph on the right or the left hand side here is all responses, um, with the red represented by anyone who flagged themselves as uh, associating with any of the schools within that cluster. The ones in gray would be anyone that did not associate with those clusters. And as you can see, there was a preference towards the replacement option, the more expensive option um, within that particular area. One thing we like to do when we disaggregate data and see things from different perspectives, we looked at just the student responses as part of it. And the proportion, and certainly there is a preference numerically um, towards B over A, but it's not to quite the degree that we saw when you include all the adults in the equation. Also, when you look overall at the responses that countywide, there was a preference towards the addition renovation projects. Also, we don't have it on here, but if we were to extrapolate a representative sampling for all the different regions, um, because there was a considerable disproportionate overabundance of response from this particular area, and if we extrapolate it out, it would be a lot more gray on the page to be proportional. Looking at the Northeast high school scenarios that were out there, it's really kind of too close to call if you're looking at it in election parlance, but the dramatic and very profound, important decision of whether or not to have a new high school as part of your portfolio is a big decision, one that only happens once in a generation. Um, is such that with this small sample size, it requires a bit more due diligence. And that's what we're recommending is that this is the opportunity now to either determine, do we continue to add to their existing high schools, option A, or do we, instead of growing those larger, keep them at current size and relieve them with a new high school that would um, deal with growth for the long haul? That was a preference towards the more, um, even within those that represented or identified with those schools, a slight edge towards the um, additions over the new school. 
and even more so with the whole county, but it really is proportionally close. We also disaggregated the data by those who associated with discrete schools. And in the example of Perry Hall, which is among your largest of your high schools and would be subject to continued growth, that there was a preference actually for the new school. Now it's pretty close in terms here. So you'll see, we've looked closely at all this data, but we're happy to report that our recommendations align very closely, almost exclusively across the entire county. So what's included? What are we recommending here um, in terms of the actual projects that are going forward? We saw you the big list, et cetera, but let's walk through them categorically. So there's um, over a quarter of a billion dollars in today's dollars for legacy projects that are out there. We have escalated some of those costs beyond what your current CIP is showing, just to be prudent because of the current state of the construction market. But these are in the priority order that's listed in your CIP, those projects here, right? The schools of our future, along with Lansdowne High School's replacement. The managed growth projects, these are your addition renovation type projects of which there are 28. Now these are grouped by the clusters, the planning clusters that were out there. And in some cases, we've identified that there's a certain magnitude of capacity that needs to be added among those and further determination of exactly how much, how many of those seats go to which of the schools um, is to be determined. There's also among these um, certain projects that would replace 1990s modulars buildings that we discussed in previous meetings. These are um, the types of facilities that really aren't of permanent quality, but however, they're classified as state rated capacity as if they're permanent construction. But we're disrupting that pattern and planning for those being replaced over the long haul, as we promised, and those replacements are included among these. So the big, the, the, the very strategic one, the educational strategy projects, the $328 million associated with these that I'll lay out here, starting with the Northeast High School that we spoke about. Right now, we don't know if there's land to build it on. We know there's a few sites that have been discussed and it's gonna require a lot of due diligence to look at those in terms of the availability um, commercially to use them, the suitability for um, supporting a high school campus, as well as just the educational planning and doing a little bit more in depth focus groups and working with the stakeholders to, to confirm where the preferences really are. We have a good you know, early sample of where things are enough to know that really it's too close to call. So we're recommending we spend the next year or two. I would like to do as quickly as possible so that we can bring relief to these schools, whether it's in the form of additions or a new high school as quick as practical and responsible. Sparrows Point, you'll recall from previous presentations last year that the um, Sparrows Point Middle School and Sparrows Point High School campuses occupy the same site, right? These are 12 year olds and 18 year olds on the same campus. Now they're very well managed. You've got tremendous leadership at these schools and they're doing a great job of running these programs and they're finding all those synergies and silver linings that could come from having two campuses in close proximity. However, there is a general acknowledgement that there are social emotional learning um, disadvantages to this sort of constraint. And it is the only place in all of Baltimore County in which this situation exists. So as part of the planning process, op draft options were forward that would remove the middle schoolers from the site, allowing the relief that campus needs in terms of capacity while achieving um, some equitable outcomes as part of it. So our recommendation is similar to the high school that we go through a phase um, as quickly as practical and as responsible to do due diligence about and as well as focus stakeholder outreach and what sorts of programs would go into these spaces, et cetera. There's another grouping of projects that are in this broad category of educational strategy that look at grade reconfiguration. Um, you might recall that Norwood Elementary and Hollibird Middle School right across the street in southeast of Baltimore County um, are operate on with a different grade configuration than the rest of the county. You have pre-K through three going to Norwood and fourth graders, eighth graders going to middle school at Hollibird. Um, we're proposing a project and recommend that there be an addition at the elementary school that would enable the fourth and fifth graders to come back home to elementary school and become consistent with the rest of the county. 
the notion of access to magnet programs was definitely something that was repeated throughout this process. And we've identified cases um, as an example from the magnet expansion. That's in kind of the southern part of central bordering with northeast um, planning areas of Baltimore County. Um, there's a, a highly regarded and very attractive magnet program there that has a waiting list. Now, we do have capacity issues in that general area, so we need to grow um, objectively. However, we look at this as an opportunity to build a little bit more and actually expand access into that magnet program that might transcend the immediate area and create more diversity and access. Career tech, we know that's um, a way of the future and there's a lot of strategy around that. And um, Dr. Williams and the team are working hard on long range planning for how we deploy CTE around the county. Acknowledging that we have budgeted a healthy $50 million budget that's on top of discrete improvements at each of the schools that could be deployed in a way that's strategic and allows equitable access. We do know that there's Eastern Tech and Western Tech, hi, Mr. Thomas, um, that are there that draw students from all over the county, in many cases coming many, many miles across the county to get to those. Um, perhaps this $50 million could be used for additions, renovations, or even new standalone um, programs that could generate equity of access towards career tech education. Then we have this classification of consolidation repurpose, and it might sound a little bit illogical with a growing um, county and school system such as Baltimore County Public Schools that we would have a case of consolidations or closing of schools, but these would be strategic in nature, taking two facilities that are small in close proximity to each other, trading up to a brand new replaced facility that's larger, which would free up some property that could be used perhaps to leverage into a public-private partnership. Looking closely at those, they're very expensive sorts of projects. We looked at Arbutus and Hailthorpe was an option that was on the table to collapse those two schools into one new facility and have a surplus property. To look at Pot Spring, Timonium, and Warren with two new facilities that would house those three programs moving forward in the future, a three for two consolidation. And Golden Ring, which is in the Northeast, which upon completion of your new middle school that's among your legacy projects, um, there would be surplus capacity at the middle school band within that region at that site um, potentially could be surplus and brought to higher and better use. Now, we do not include the budget for doing those replacements in our recommendations. However, we are recommending that there be a pilot study to explore public-private partnerships and see whether these projects could be implemented on a cost-neutral basis. Special education and alternative education, $71 million between these two very vital programs as part of the, um, your portfolio of services to your communities. And we heard in these focus groups um, that we had with stakeholders, both internal and external, an expressed desire for improving those standalone facilities that we have, but also distributing these programs more broadly. Um, and in addition to the $71 million listed here for your centers, there's another $50 million for special ed that's included in the renovation budget we're about to speak in a, about to in a moment. A heavy investment to support these vital programs. There's also included uh, a new state-of-the-art and built-to-suit facility for the special education center that's housed currently at the White Oak facility. Now, in addition to creating a whole new program that's supported with state-of-the-art facilities, it also has the benefit that the White Oak facility, in turn, upon completion of that, could be used um, with a, a modest renovation, could become a swing school or create swing space so that we can put superchargers on the schedule of all the renovation and addition projects at the elementary level within the Northeast and Central area that it's proximate to. And at the end state of the process, you would have an additional facility for expanded capacity moving forward. So we recommend um, getting into these prioritized renovations, but they need to be informed with continued focus and engagement with the stakeholders as those programs get defined and evolve over time. Alternative education, a very vital program um, that has two facets to it, has definitely the, um, the voluntary notion where students that just aren't, they don't thrive in a traditional school setting opt for these sorts of programs or conversely, those that need a, a timeout from their home schools 
attend these particular centers. We had uh, very, very engaged conversations with them and understood that there's the notion that beyond just um, improving the, the home life feel of these facilities and to create a nurturing environment for these students, that also that be an acknowledgement of a need to support the transition back into the home school with dedicated spaces and supports for those students. So we're recommending as part of this $71 million, those enhancements, again, that are defined in close consultation um, with the leadership of the programs and the community members that have um, lifted their voice and really want to see enhancements on those programs. I mentioned earlier pre-K early education. We have Blueprint of Maryland's Future um, legislation that's um, going through its process. It has a lot of question marks associated with it. At the end of the day, what it's speaking to is the notion of requiring full-day pre-kinder um, pre access um, for families within a certain uh, multiple of the poverty level of household income. Now, this the impact of this would be additions, conversions of spaces, or even standalone facilities that uh, might be needed. And we've done an initial impact study, um, even in acknowledgement of these unknown factors of um, you know, the, the exact numbers of students particularly as it relates to the proportion that would be in public versus private um, opportunities that are out there and um, the preferences of parents um, as well as the state funding to support these sorts of things. So we, our initial impact studies I mentioned earlier was about a year perhaps to uh, extension on your entire capital program, but not a quantum um, you know, multi-year type extension, extension as part of it. So our recommendations is to monitor this really closely um, and look at those legislative requirements moving forward, advocate for not just a mandate, but also funding to support it. And, um, you know, if action is required and no new funding is available, that the contingency we put in place is not scaling back all the rest of the program, but rather look at a moderate one to two year extension on time. Which gets to the bulk of the program. This really speaks to the equity and transformative outcomes that go um, across the entire portfolio of your schools, and that's the renovations and enhancements that are out there. $1.6 billion with a B of reinvestment back to your older facilities that bring with it not just repairs to the systems, but also looking at program supports bringing the educational infrastructure in place that's consistent with what you build when you build new today, um, looking at supports for the physical and um, emotional health that are so critically important as we're pulling out of a pandemic, um, putting in place alterations so you have a diversity of sizes and, and types of spaces that facilitate not just double-loaded corridors with the same classroom over and over again, but having the opportunity for extended learning areas where um, instructors can dispatch groups of students to work on projects together with line of sight through transparent walls uh, and sound attenuation, as well as um, individual inquiry, et cetera, that can be done. And at long last, we've put in there for all of those cases, those 1970s, open plan classrooms that once and for all these are resolved and they're recommended as part of the deployment of this facet of the work. Another critically important part of this is we've looked closely at the student populations and working in close concert with Dr. Williams's staff and leadership, we've looked at um, the sorts of socioeconomic indicators and school population, student population indicators that would drive at facility supports that would help address your most vulnerable populations. So the sorts of um, improvements that are on here and the distribution geographically of where they are included in the plan include laundry, shower, food pantry sorts of facilities to support your homeless population of students so that they could arrive at school, clean themselves up and attend school with dignity. Um, child care and early childhood education programs at high schools where it creates a CTE opportunity as well as creates a support for your students that are also parents. Supports for your English learners um, programs, as well as community health facilities for those wraparound services that we hear are, are a priority, um, particularly in certain um, parts of the community where there's a high um, uh, uh, group of, of um, low income um, population, as well as supports for social emotional learning 
uh, parent resource centers to provide space and resources and access and counseling for families where it's not a foregone conclusion that college is in the future, as well as those supports for additional space for um, preparing our, all of our learners for reading and math, et cetera. So all these are included as part of the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. This is the Maya Pass. This is our recommendation. All schools, all students, within a reasonable implementation timeline with a particular focus on educational equity at capacity. So next steps, you've seen our plan, you've seen categorically where our recommendations are. This is the timeline, I'm sorry, my screen wasn't sharing, I thought it was earlier. Um, but looking forward, where things go from here. Our contract is structured where we make these recommendations on schedule today. We also have a couple of months of documentation period where we're writing our reports and we're translating these recommendations into an execution plan and final report. So what does that look like? If we were to take a 15 year planning horizon, if you look at this budget here as a flat line of your 140 million plus the built to learn active an additional 40 million for 10 years, dropping off to your more traditional levels, we're going to have to broadcast all these projects across a timeline. And that's what we're busy already working with staff on doing in a way one that fits the kind of force order of the prioritization dictated by the facility assessments as a first pass. Also looking closely at the logic and sequence of when these projects need to take place, such as in Sparrows Point, where we need to take care of the middle school project before vacating, allowing the high school project to be renovated, et cetera. The sequence of events of these projects is very critical, and we're looking closely at how we sequence these things over time. And um, in the final report, you're gonna see in uh, September timeframe, we'll have all those details associated with it. That's our presentation for this evening and our final recommendations for the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, but happily take any questions or dialogue you care to engage in. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, it looks like we have some questions from some board members. So it looks like first is uh, Mr. McMillian. Okay, great. Mr. Mills, thank you very much for your all of your all of work. I've enjoyed your different presentations over the last months. On slide 32, you mentioned the Spares Point Middle School and High School separation. On slide 24, you talk about, or you don't really talk about, you have a diagram, replace, repurpose, renovate, repurpose, Chesapeake Terrace and Edgemere Elementary. Could you expand how that, those two elementary schools play into the possibility of separating Spares Point Middle and High Schools? Thank you. Um, happily, and thanks for the question. Um, in the Sparrows Point area, we looked at all schools, elementary, middle, and high school together composite due to its geographical um, notion. You're kind of at the end of the line there on the peninsula, as well as the very challenging, unique circumstances of the middle school and high school being together. So we planned all those facilities in one tranche. The sorts of outcomes that were there was option A was just status quo. Let's make permanent the coexistence of the middle school and high school and just because you're crowded put some additions in place and you can continue carrying on with your great programs that are there in the same fashion that they are today option b and c were really similar in the, the notion that um, one of the elementary sites would become the new home of the middle school and the other one would become the, the site of a new combined elementary school so basically collapse your two elementary schools into each other in a new larger facility, um, brand new, as well as um, middle school that would occupy the other site. B and C are just which site becomes the middle school, which site becomes the elementary school. Option D, which was the one that was most strongly preferred by the stakeholders affected by it, was the notion of finding land and let's build a new home for the middle school and that the elementary schools would remain as they are, but they would undergo prioritize renovations just like all of the campuses across the county. Um, because there's still some question marks as to what the end state of this process is, and we're recommending that we invest the next year in in-depth focus groups, um, studying what's the best way to go, how we can get some land down in that area, which is challenging, 
um, to come up with the best optimal solution that results in um, you know, the best outcomes and equity for the students in that area. And as such, they're kind of qualified with that repurpose, but it is conditional on the outcome of that, that study. Uh, Mr. McGillian, I hope I addressed your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Next looks like it's Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Ms. Scott, I can't get into the chat, so can you just fit me in wherever, please? Sure, certainly. This we have is Mr. Kuhn. Yes, that's Ms. Pastor. So we have um, Mr. Kuhn, Ms. Jose, and then um, Ms. Pastor, you'll be after Ms. Jose. Thank you. Certainly. Go ahead, Thank Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Mr. Mills, thanks for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> Mr. McMillian already asked the questions I had regarding the middle school, high school combination. I look forward uh, to your final report uh, for, for greater detail. But one of the general questions that I had um, was to ask you about facility life life cycle overall, because it seems as if we're keying in this 15 year life cycle, and I don't disagree or agree with it. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to expand my understanding. And <clears throat> you work in lots of different areas with these facilities and these types of facilities, and. My question to you is with, and it's a big with, right? Because proper maintenance operations and maintenance costs a lot of money to, to handle facilities and keep them in good shape. What is the life cycle and the lifespan of a school uh, before it deteriorates to the point where it, it requires an upgrade to be functional and, and worthwhile? I, I'm just, I mean, we have some very old facilities across the entire our inventory, right? Um, so I'm trying to understand what our expectations should be and what it what it normally is across the industry and across the country, uh, you know, for a facility. Uh, great question, and thank you for it. Um, you already hinted at you know, kind of the first part of the answer. It really depends on the amount of reinvestment over time into it. It depends on the type of construction materials originally deployed. A lot of your portfolio is from kind of post-war baby boom era in which the priorities were, we need them, we need them fast, we need them cheap, and we had to build them fast. So the quality of the materials was less so. Now they've been updated over time, et cetera. And um, the life cycle, really the building can depend. You know, if you look back even further, you know, give me a good building from the teens that were over-engineered <laughs> um, with challenging structures maybe to adapt in today's models but that can withstand the test of time and also our iconic buildings, such as your historic ones you have, you know, up in um, the northern part of central, out in um, your rural areas, as well as facilities like Towson High School um, that are out there. I, I, as far as giving you an exact age of how long a facility can last, it's really difficult to hone in on a particular number. We're really yeah. looking like the 15 year horizon really is a refresh cycle to set up a new pattern of sustainable reinvestment in your facilities in which every facility, every predictable cycle would be subject to a refresh um, with, you know, a reassessment of the needs of the time. Right. And that's fair. And, and to just kind of follow up with that, would with what you know now about construction and what you expect these facilities to look like as we move forward is, is this 15 years, slide to 20 years. I'm just trying to understand the range. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to modify what, what you guys have focused on and, and what you've reported. I'm just, I, I want to know what makes sense going forward. Um, let me make sure, I'm not sure if I particularly understand the, the notion of your last okay, question. Okay, I'll but. restate it simply. From this point forward, as we continue to build new schools, because we are building them, is the expectation that if they are maintained that in 15 years they will need to be refreshed or is it 20 years or 25 years? I, you know, we have inventory that's been built in different ways over many periods of time, but from now, from this point forward, as you're trying to devise this overall idea, right, of refresh and rebuild or whatever, that's, yeah. that's what I'm trying to get to. We, we had this question earlier today with County Council. I'll let Dr. Lever take it. Yeah, the expectation in Maryland among uh, facility planners is that when you build a new school, 
it would typically last 30 years, possibly 40 years with the right kind of maintenance. But within that period, systems deteriorate at different rates. Um, a roof, for instance, has a life expectancy generally somewhere between 20 and 25 years. Carpet might be seven years, paint might be seven years. Mechanical system, depending on the components, anywhere from 15 years to 25 years. So refresh within a 15 year period doesn't mean replacement or complete renovation of the facility. It just means that systems have to be upgraded in order to extend the life. And we also find, because as uh, Mr. Mills said, the schools built in the uh, 60s and the 70s for the baby boom, the anticipation was that they wouldn't be needed after that boom passed through. But of course, they're still in use. So even though we build for, say, a 30 or 40 year time period, I think realistically, we know that those schools are likely to be there in 50 years, possibly 60 years or 70 years. So there will be multiple cycles of refresh that will be necessary in that life cycle. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. To follow on that, and um, as we're looking at this capital planning process, the operations and maintenance activities that you're talking about, in essence, refreshing these systems and keeping them all running, is that being considered in any of this as to say, and you're going to need $100 million in uh, you know, maintenance activity every year going forward or $50 million or whatever? Do you understand? Like. Here's all this building we're going to continuously do, but we also need to maintain everything that we have. What is the price tag for that, and where is it, or is it not in your report? Uh, great question. The foundation of this report is the facility assessment that was done in the earlier stages of, of this process, in which the technical teams went out and assessed the physical health of your various systems on all your buildings, and also didn't just look at, hey, what's broken today? but also looking at a reasonable life cycle timeframe for all those building systems. So we created a projection over time. That's the underpinnings of this work and included in those budgets. Now, some of those, those um, renovation enhancement projects, whether they're standalone or they're con in conjunction with an addition at a site um, might be such that certain systems might be scraped off as a horizontal procurement to take care of all the ADA issues for instance, or to do all the roofs with a big horizontal procurement where you get economies of scale and good pricing. Those sorts of tactical notions of implementing the projects are something that's going to be done at a future date. We're putting in place a framework and an affordable budget that you can scale projects in a way such that, that you can actually equitably deploy them over a reasonable time frame across your whole portfolio. Thank you. Thank you. Next, it looks like we have Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Mills, for this presentation. I appreciate the data-driven uh, capital improvement planning and emphasis on special education, which was undergirded by equity. I also believe that a good capital improvement plan should always bridge the gap between planning and spending. So you stated that the funding of facilities should be allocated and spread to benefit as many students, and you kind of stayed with that narrative. Um, I saw $4.7 billion for total implementation, and $2.5 billion is what we have along with the bill to act. That shows a $2.2 billion deficit. Did you do a cost escalation for 15 years? And um, Mr. Kuhn asked some of my questions. So. The cumulative effect of deferring major maintenance expenditures is often that a series of uh, stopgap measures which fail to address comprehensive long-term needs. Uh, so at some point, the renovation would not be feasible or not be a good rate of return. For instance, I think Dundalk Elementary was a 100-year school that was recently replaced. Um, and since they all built at different times, when would that time be reached, and again, it's going to de depend on the facilities. So essentially, a student entering kindergarten would likely graduate in 13 years and without seeing any major improvements to that school with the 15-year um, life cycle or you know time to touch a school. Uh, so my second question is, where is the White Oak Center located? And um, Mr. McMillian addressed my Sparrow's point. That is the only school in a system which is a combined middle and high school. Uh, and, you know, that's not acceptable. So I'm glad that you touched on that as well. So if, um, my two questions. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. So two questions. Um, one is about the kind of refresh cycle that we're looking at. We're getting roughly around an entire pre-K through graduation sort of life cycle turnaround for each facility. And chances are anyone coming up and matriculating through your system is going to be the beneficiary at multiple um, or at very least one of the facilities that they're going to occupy during that life cycle. Um, the White Oak facility is very close to um, Oakley Elementary School, just south of there, um, on right around the county line corner with the city um, on, I think it technically is part of your central planning area, but right adjacent with the Northeast. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mills. And did you escalate the cost, the current oh, cost? Yes, thanks for not letting me get away without addressing it. Yes, we have included cost escalation in our cost um, projections and model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Pasteur. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Mills, thank you for uh, the work and particularly taking a look at... Um, uh, the CTE program, though I do want to just say to um, just say that we're not just talking about what needs to happen at Western. We're also talking about, because that's a specialty school, about basic CTE programs, particularly on the West yes. Side, that will give some equity and parity to uh, our students on that side. So thank you for bringing that up, attention to the open plan classrooms. Um, we have you, and I've talked about that at Randallstown High School yes. as well. But in your conversation, and I don't have the benefit of seeing, quite seeing everything, so I can't really tell you which slide, but I know it was one that had a multitude of things on it. Um, so I don't know the number, but uh, somewhere prior to that, you mentioned, as you talked about the various projects, and this I'm asking just so we know as a board how to think about this, that if certain projects are done, I guess it's new buildings, et cetera, some of the smaller projects, if you will call them smaller, maybe legacy product projects or other projects might be cut. Um, meaning that some schools won't get the things the, or the benefit of the things that are uh, on your plan. Can you just give me a little bit more detail? I was trying to take notes, but I can't see, so, see it. So I really Absolutely. Um, just as a, a point of clarity, when we use the term legacy projects, we're referring to partially funded projects that are already underway. Um, there are several replacement schools, um, addition renovations, et cetera, the new schools that are in the pipeline as part of that. And those were not relitigating decisions. We are fulfill promises, right? Um, but uh, as far as looking at trade-offs, that's something we look very closely at. And really when we're looking through the lens, we're hearing from stakeholders directly and seeing it measured in survey responses in terms of um, the takeaways of maximizing the benefit to as many students as possible, delivering within a reasonable time frame, and really focusing on adequacy and equity and condition or capacity, perhaps as 1A, 1B, right there with um, um, condition of the buildings right after it, is that we had to look at trade-offs. As um, uh, Board Member Joes was just mentioning, you know, there's a big gap that had to be closed. So we had to look closely at the scopes of work time frames and budgets in a way that was um, challenging to do if we were to do the premium projects which included a handful of replacements as opposed to additions to deal with um, uh, your capacity um, over utilization in certain areas it would result in dozens and actually 86 projects if all of the premium projects were done 86 projects would fall off the list of the 15-year planning horizon. That's half of the portfolio. 86 projects. Okay, so that's incumbent on those of us on the board to keep sight of that. That's an, a very important um, um, note that you have just given. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I echo what others have said. I always enjoy your presentations, and thank you so much for so clearly explaining everything. Um, I have two questions. The first is, what does a public-private partnership look like in a public school system? I have a range of ideas in my head, but I'd love to hear from you about what you envision with something like that. I'm going to take a, a quick hack at it, but I'm going to let Dr. Oliva really address it. But um, it's it's a delivery method for construction projects, any sort of infrastructure um, in which the design and construction are delivered, but it also includes a financing element to it, right? So they're going to bring, it's basically a lender teams up with a, de a design builder to deliver work. And it's done in a turnkey sort of efficient way. However, because you're coming with a lender associated with it, you're a public agency with excellent credit rating. You can probably, your your cost of financing is much lower as a public agency than a private sector can provide. So it's those that are out there saying, hey, it's free money. Well, kind of. It might be a quicker, more accessible way to deliver projects and perhaps you can beat a power curve of the market, et cetera. However, there's some financing elements that are there. You asked about what it looks like. Um, it's kind of that wraparound design, build, plus finance part of it. Typically, these are set up for things like um, toll routes and things that have a continuous revenue stream associated with it. For a, a, a leased asset or an asset that is occupied, such as a school, it's kind of a lease back revenue stream. So you basically be paying um, rent on your own facility to pay back that investment they've, they've made over a certain amount of time. And there'd be some protections for the investors where um, the, the asset would remain there as after a time frame where it might be reverted back to the county. A lot of ways to structure it. David, I'm sure I missed a lot of stuff. But what I'll add to your statement, Paul, is there are basically two models. Uh, one model that's been used extensively in Canada and used for schools is what's called the availability payment model where a private developer will build the facility and will take on not only the cost of construction and finance, but also certain aspects of maintenance and operations to be worked out with the school system. And then the school system, or in the case of the candidates, the province, pays an availability payment. It might be every six months, it might be once a year, over a 25-year or 30-year period, which pays back that investment. And at the end of that term, the school system might acquire the building. The, the uh, title might revert to the school system. And presumably in very good condition because the school system has the option to refuse if it's not in good condition. Uh, Canada, especially the province of Alberta, used this as a way to get ahead of the curve when they had the shale oil growth and a massive demographic uh, shift and student enrollment growth. And they had to build the schools very, very quickly. And so um, the advantage here was not necessarily less cost, but it was speed. The other model is the one that's represented by the Oyster School in Washington, D.C., where a, a small site, it was about three acres, they partitioned off about one acre, a high-rise apartment building was put up on that uh, acre, and the revenues that came from the sales and then from the uh, property taxes went into what was called a lockbox, which was used to pay back the cost for replacing the very small elementary school, which is right on the corner there. And so you've got a state-of-the-art elementary school on a reduced site. It's called asset leverage, basically. And it doesn't have to be the same site. If a school system or even the local government has a very valuable site that developers think they would be interested in, then an arrangement can be made that the developer gets the site, builds what they need, and part of the revenue, part of their profit, in effect, goes to pay off the cost for the capital improvement at that site or at a nearby site. Um, so that question has to be investigated. It takes a lot of research, and obviously a lot of risk is involved in this as well. There is a reason, I think, that the first model I mentioned has not been used in the United States. It has been used in Canada, but not in the United States. And as uh, Paul said, Prince George's County Public Schools now is actually the first in the nation. And we're venturing into this field to build a number of middle schools and high schools in the northern part of the county. So we're all watching very carefully to see what the outcome will be in Prince George's County. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful explanation. And I, I was in, honestly envisioning us uh, 
letting private companies run charter schools. I didn't really understand where you were going with that, so your explanation was fantastic. Um, my second question uh, is really just kind of what, what's our next move as a school board? Do we approve the whole 15-year plan? Are we approving incremental aspects of this um, once the final report comes out in September? You know, what is the expectation on our end? I'd probably defer to Mr. Dixit and Dr. Williams on, on that score, but our recommendations lays a roadmap of CIPs for the next 15 years, but a time frame starting with this year. Um, so thank, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let me try to help you with that. So uh, as you know, the funding is provided by Baltimore County and Maryland State, and also uh, the plan is approved by Baltimore County and state. So what we are going to try to do is get a consensus from all the parties. So as part of our submission of plan, every year we are going to ask you to approve certain projects that will be incorporated in our annual capital plan, and they'll be based on the recommendation from my IPAS. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looks like our next questions are from Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mills, for the presentation. I was hoping you could um, give us a deeper explanation or um, of your recommendation regarding the Northeast Middle School and specifically to Golden Ring Middle. And I appreciate Dr. Hager's question about the private-public partnership. I was wondering the same thing myself. And I believe you had um, said that Golden Ring Middle was a potential um, example of one of those. And with the legacy project of constructing a new Northeast Middle, I'm curious as to the synergies there and what your recommendation entails for both um, providing the much-needed um, capacity for middle school seats in the Northeast area, um, what that would look like for Golden Ring Middle, both after the new Northeast Middle opens, um, as well as long-term. So if you could comment on that. Absolutely. So the, Thank you. the capital improvement program justification for the, the new middle school included the notion that Golden Ring, which is generally regarded as one of the poor condition facilities among your whole portfolio, would become Sur potential surplus property, which is great. You know, it's an asset that could be leveraged into higher and better use, whether it's converted into a new facility or an alternative education, special education administration. A new school of growth decides to take a, a steep climb upwards in the in the future. Um, but being a surplus asset at the end of the day could be a recipe or an ingredient for the recipe of private partnership. There could be a land swap, investiture, some sort of way you can actually extract the value of that asset that's being underutilized in a way that achieves, you know, some of the strategy. Did I address your question, um, Vice Chair? Partially. So the plan would still be to close it, and it would be viewed as a surplus asset at that point. So there's some background noise. I'm, I'm having a little difficulty hearing you, but I believe that's what you had said. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. But we're, we're suggesting that there be a pilot study for those P3 sorts of avenues that would touch potentially that project as well as one in the Southwest and one in Central. Right. The, the concern is that with future development um, that's planned for the White Marsh area, that there is that there are additional capacity needs within that area and that prematurely closing Golden Ring Middle um, may not be the best long-term decision. So I would hate to make that move and then find us five years um, down the road needing middle school seats in the same area. Right. So knowing that the school is in the condition that it would need extensive renovations, um, I'm asking right. to see if that has been fully considered. Um, I'm struggling to hear. I think I'm getting maybe two out of three words, but just... If so everyone could mute. make sure I'm understanding. Yes. And just to be clear, our recommendation is to go close the school. It's explore um, what the outcome is. This is on the out here. You know, the good news is you're going to have the development of a new middle school, and time will go down the road. It needs to be a refresh of your enrollment projections. You really look at that and on what the needs are at that point in time. So we're not making a hard, fast rule of what the outcome is of that site, but to keep the options open and to explore whether there could be some potential of leveraging um, the asset into higher, better use for the, the entire system. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was muted because we are hearing, I don't know, it sounds like some feedback or some background noise. Uh, next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank Mr. Mills and Dr. Lever for the presentation, and I also wanted to thank um, all the staff that's worked on this, as well as all the volunteers. There's been a lot of community involvement, as um, was uh, indicated by Mr. Mills. I also appreciate the effort to evaluate all schools um, at the same time, to really get an understanding of the needs throughout the county and to address things equitably. Um, I support the $71 million for special education and alternative education. Um, I visited Battle Monument and Maiden Choice and understand the aging facilities, but also the complex equipment uh, that's needed to take care of our uh, students with the greatest challenge and most medically fragile. Um, there's a lot of um, really great um, recommendations in here. The renovations and enhancements for special ed career tech, Sparrows Point Middle School and High School separation. I support that and the grade realignment um, and also the um, legacy projects, um, which uh, the board has approved through the years, um, a lot of the time that I've been on the board. Um, I do just want to uh, say that I am concerned and I um, have consistently supported replacement schools where it is um, fiscally prudent, but also uh, important when you look at the impact on students. Um, I've supported that planning for Lansdowne High School, Delaney, and um, Towson High School. Um, and those are warranted for structural and um, also for overcapacity issues. Um, I'm concerned that both Towson and Delaney have been um, downgraded to renovations, and I'm concerned that the uh, disruption and the danger and the delay um, is not really being considered, as well as the cost of swing space. Um, my own students lived through a replacement, uh, a renovation in place, and there was a great deal of disruption, uh, a great, there was a, uh, Danger and there was also uh, delays in the construction time frame, which add dollars as well as uh, impact. So um, I'm hoping that there'll be some additional, I will be requesting additional information around the costing. Um, and also there really has not been any um, information about the swing space. Uh, Delaney has the excess land to build a, a school on the land while the children are in the school. So there's not a need for swing space. Uh, Towson, I don't even know how one would consider a replacement, a, a renovation in place uh, with those students with a very small campus. Um, so while I have concerns about those issues, I um, you know, really look at this as a, a very, very positive thing for Baltimore County um, in that we are really taking a look. We're really taking a long range look and we're also looking at the dollars. I appreciate your uh, points about uh, reducing scope, redistricting, um, and looking at those additions instead of replacements where appropriate. Um, I did wanna ask you, because we were talking about your predictable um, data-driven in terms of the projections. There's been um, wide um, media attention, as well as we know in our own school, uh, disruption in, in our projections of our student enrollment. So has there been any um, additional analysis related to the effect of the pandemic on um, the projections, especially in the short term where we might have a double first grade You're over class. time, Ms. Clausey. Thank you. So Mr. Lever, if you could just address the issues of projections. Mm -hmm. Or Mr. Mills. I think David might be on mute, but I'll, I'll go ahead and um, take a first round here. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Causey, for the question and for your kind words about um, the process. Um, the, um, the enrollment projections were provided by Baltimore County, and as we've addressed earlier in this process over the, the last year and a half, that um, uh, we did look at the methodologies and confirm they were consistent with industry best practices um, for addressing them. As far as addressing a refresh from the pandemic, it's really too soon to too soon to call on it. I, there's going to be definitely a kind of a wave that that floats through the system and matriculates out as part of it. 
Um, and the demographers that do that sort of work are going to have some interesting challenges um, here in the near term to look at it. We do know that you have a virtual offering that is going to persist into the fall, and that could have some impact on capacity utilization as well. So there's a lot of factors here that need to go forward. But we're, we're looking at the springboard for long-range planning being the year prior to um, the pandemic and using the reasonable time frame of the 2026-27 projection, which the dust settling after the pandemic time frame is probably going to rationalize itself out. We believe that the state has used something similar in the methodology, although they reported the 2020 enrollments. It appears that the projections that they make beyond 2020 are actually based on the 2019 enrollments, uh, the more stable enrollments before the unusual circumstances of the pandemic hit. Thank you. Next, it looks like it's uh, Ms. Rowe. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone who participated in this, including Dr. Lever. And the one thing that I have that I am concerned about that I feel like hasn't really been addressed is that at the same time you all were doing your work, the county council did the APFO task force that determined that the way our county laws are written in regard to development exacerbates problems for planning for our school system and the county for keeping school facilities at or below capacity. And I wanted to know, just like you gave us the impact of building a couple higher-end projects, the opportunity cost is 86 school projects. Have you looked at um, being able to stick to this plan in regard to the recommendations of the APFL task force as far as the things that they said as far as development in certain areas exacerbating um, school overcrowding, like for instance, using Chesapeake High School's capacity in order to say you can build in Sparrows Point High School area, but there's a huge body of water with no bridges or ferries between those two school zones. So like those sorts of things, I could see if the county council doesn't act on the APFO task force, this plan could be completely asked by any number of changing variables. Um, so we didn't take a, a super deep dive into policy issues, and it was contemporaneous with our work, so it's really challenging to incorporate those sorts of recommendations in here. However, um, looking at structures that could throttle growth or at least put in place impact fees and such so that um, you know, the tax base is there to accommodate the growth is certainly something that um, ought to be, you know, that we would recommend and, and advocate or suggest that you advocate for. Okay, I think my biggest concern is the fact that just the fact that you presented these projects here tonight allows developers to start seeking approval for new development. And we could be 15 years away from finishing these products and they could be five years away from finishing theirs. And developers at that rate will always outpace us. I'm sorry, was there a... Uh a question there, um, or did you all have well, a response guess, for Ms. Rowe? I guess my concern is less about the taxes and more about pacing of development. Okay. Did you all have a response for Ms. Rowe, or or was it just, I guess, your, a statement? Yeah, I would just echo that I agree that um, this needs to be a, a comprehensive approach that involves strategic planning of your capital program aligned with your educational missions and also aligned with policy decisions around um, development. The uh, concept of grade succession ratio, a cohort survival, which is uh, intrinsic to the projection methodology, takes account of the rate of growth in the past, and it makes an assumption that with new development, the rate of growth will be similar going into the future but it also aligned with the number of uh, live births, um, the ratio of, of children that go into kindergarten and first grade. Um, so in theory, 
unless you get something very unusual happening, a sudden spurt of growth, the projections already look at and encompass the notion of housing growth. Um, that can be thrown off, of course, by a major development or by an unusual circumstance. Thank you. Um, and I just had uh, one thank you for this presentation and all the work um, that everyone um, put into presenting us with this. And um, I guess my question was, was uh, what would happen or what would happen to the projects or, and development? And I believe you, you touched on that, but I wanted to see if you could just talk just a wee bit more about it. Um, if projects that are suggested for instead of um, replacement, but like, uh, as you said, renovations, if those, like uh, Ms. Calsey had said, like uh, she mentioned Delaney and, and Towson, and I believe you had said those were suggested for uh, renovation um, as opposed to replacement. If they are indeed put on as replacement, what would that do to other projects on the list? How would that impact other rebuilt projects? Right. So I mentioned earlier that um, all of the premium projects would impact or result in 86 or essentially exactly half of your portfolio being pushed beyond the 15-year mark. Um, Towson and Delaney are the two most expensive redevelopment options that were considered, being senior high schools, being large in scale, and being complicated as um, as board member Causey was suggesting, you know, the, the impact of, of swing space and the challenging to redevelop, whether it's a renovation or in addition, those are expensive projects. Um, but those two, if they were replaced on site, would displace 41 of those 68 projects beyond the 15-year mark. And do you have a list of those 41 um, projects and what communities they are located in? Um, we could generate one. There's, there's the list that we showed that showed the 68, and there's some subtle nuances there about the relative... Um, <laughs> The, the renovations, some of them have a little bit more of the higher priorities and some of them have a little bit less and there's some subtleties as to which ones exactly. But if you looked at the four sort ranked order based on the assessment priority list, it's the ones towards the bottom that would fall off first. Okay, so that list that you showed us where, where it had all of those um, listed by color coded. Could you put, could you put that back up? that slide back up and you're saying it's the ones that are on the bottom that would fall off. So would it be um, countywide or would it be concentrated in one area? Um, I guess that's it what I'm trying to understand. To be, uh, there's a pretty consistent spread across um, the different regions. And let me make this so my 50 year old eyes can actually see it. Cause yeah, it sounds like out of, you said 170 campuses, 41 projects that would be pushed out or pushed off. Right. So the ones that are in dark gray here are the ones if you were to do all of the premium projects, the two most expensive ones of those premium projects um, that would be um, in the realm of half of the premium projects that are there pushes out um, about 41 of those facilities that would be tend to be the ones towards the bottom of the groups of gray that would push out beyond the 15 year cycle. Now to the impact of two projects. So two projects that would benefit, I guess, a, several thousand children or a couple thousand children would then impact countywide, I guess, and this is rough math, more than like 50,000 children um, in schools that would not um, be developed or would be pushed out to have their development take a longer period of time. <laughs> Um, without checking your math, that sounds about right. And, um, you know, it's just the notion of trade-offs here. I would love that all the schools, facilities could be, uh, receive the maximum, you know, remedies to all the way to complete replacements. It's just simply with the limited resources there, we can't professionally recommend that you would do that. Thank you very much. I just wanted to have a, a, a understanding um, so that it, uh, just in very direct language, um, I'm not an engineer, as is Ms. Jose, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to get a very basic understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right. So that um, thank you for the presentation. Um, and so then we can move on. I would 
like to see if um, we could, or I could make a motion to postpone S and U to the August 10th meeting. Second. Okay. Um, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote on that, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Um, I'll say no. <laughs> Ms. Mack? Yeah. Can I just ask for a clarification? S, as I see it, is public comment. Uh, uh, no, it's no. Um, board committee board. updates. Oh, okay. You, um, I had to recycle. Uh, to recycle. I, if you sorry. refresh I, I board recycle. Yeah. So yes, yes. I yeah. just wanted to clarify. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Board committee board updates committee. and board member comments and agenda setting. Just to clarify. Ms. Mack? Sorry. I said yes. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I uh, change my vote to yes because my, doc, my board doc said different agenda items. Oh, okay. So I appreciate Ms. Mack uh, asking for clarity on that. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So then that brings us to... V, announcements. Excuse me, I'm sorry, that actually brings us to T and then V, correct? Let me make sure. All right. <laughs> so the next item on the agenda are information items, which include the 2021 summer programs, 2021 to 22 special education staff plan, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools, Public Charter Schools Renewal Process, FY 2023 Operating and Capital Budget Schedules, Policy Review Committee, Policy Editing Conventions for 2021 through 2022, Policies Scheduled for Review for 2021 to 2022, Questions and Answers on Appeals and Hearing Handbook and the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council Meeting Minutes of of May 17th, 2021. And now we're at item V, and the last item on the agenda is announcements. And this board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, August 10th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. And we thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Good night.